Section eight of Stories from the Detectives Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. The Blood of the Grape. Just as the sun was throwing his last beams low on the bosom of our bay, and the slow shades of approaching night were creeping solemnly over the wavy waters, the steamer Malvoisie was passing Cape Shank. There was a strong east and south breeze blowing, and the man at watch up in the Cape Shank lighthouse saw the steamer with interest as the signals were hoisted, and the telegraph operator sent quick-winged words up to Melbourne that the Malvoisie had passed the heads. As the steamer careened to the wind, and showed her sea-stained copper bottom to the watchman, in whose charge was the wonderful mechanism of the revolving light in Cape Shank lighthouse, the waves rolled round her, and the foam splashed up against her bows, as if angry that she was to leave the blue waves so soon. The smoke of her funnels drifted slowly away on the sea, and amalgamated with the low gathering mist, until you could not distinguish one from the other. Yet what a difference there is between smoke and mist! The steamer was a seabird that had swam twelve or thirteen thousand miles over the great solitary ocean to bring beating hearts and many hopes to this wonderful Australia of ours. Her bosom had breasted many fierce storms, her plumage had been ruffled and drenched by a hundred winds, her heart had beaten steadily through it all in quick panting gasps when the hard storm of the cape made her scud under courses, and softly as the heart of a sleeping bird when nothing opposed her steady purpose, and she swam to the north of lone Kerguelen land. She had beaten and overcome all, storm and calm, wind and wave, and here she was safely within a few hours of her haven. Ah, some of us would give more than we possess for the steady purpose and indomitable determination to reach our goal displayed by the seabird Malvoisie. It's wonderful, said the watcher at Cape Shank, as in his huge lamp, with the wind making thunder around him, and his beautiful revolving apparatus going like a human life below, he watched the Malvoisie roll to and fro on the big waves, yet keep her steady course onward. She seemed so near that you could pitch a stone into her from the priest's cave, yet I dare say she is in her courses. But he said it doubtfully, and with a shake of the head, you see, our friend of the lighthouse was not a pilot. On the deck of the Malvoisie, many anxious eyes were strained up the bay, and many voluminous tongues were calculating the time it would take them to reach Melbourne. There were two persons, however, whose thoughts lay deeper than many words, one by nature, the other by repression. They stood together near a bulwark, a tall, strong, fair-haired man of about thirty, and graceful yet self-reliant woman of, say, twenty-seven. She gazed with a yearning, eager gaze onward. He looked at Cape Shank and the wonderful revolving light becoming each moment brighter as the darkness grew on the water. "'So we shall soon part, mademoiselle, I presume,' the tall, strong, fair man said at last to the silent woman, who gazed toward Melbourne. "'Yes, I suppose so, Mr. Morris,' was the rather absent reply. "'And are you glad to reach the end of our journey? I am sure I know I am. Such a life!' Who would be a sailor? Have you any friends to meet you, mademoiselle? No. But see here, that will never do, cried Morris, as with his hands in his pockets he turned suddenly facing her. I understand that even yet Melbourne swarms with, with, well, with people who will take all sorts of advantage of one. What can you do among such without friends? I have an object, she replied quietly and an object may lead a determined woman to the very gates of death itself. He looked at her with a wondering expression on his shrewd, handsome features. She was looking again straight up the darkening bay, as though burning to be at their destination. "'I have never understood you,' he said, as he looked at the firm, dark, sharply cut French face. "'Though people who make such a long voyage as we have done in company generally get to know a good deal of each other's characters.' but you have been strangely reticent, and I have tried to be a gentleman. Now, however, I have one word to say. If it is in the power of an honest man to help you in this strange land, you have but to ask Charles Morris, and he will give it to you. You are very good, was all she said, and in such a cold tone that impulsively Charlie Morris turned on his heel and walked to the farthest end of the quarter-deck. Well, now, he soliloquised, 
I am vexed about that woman. There's something evidently wrong about her. I mean, as to her being troubled. Yet she's so like an oyster that you might as well try to get her troubles out of her as though she were a bivalve. And I've not got the oyster knife, you see. I wonder if Clements will be sure to meet me. I shall be like a fish out of water in this much-talked-of Melbourne, of which, after all, we know of far less than we do of the Sandwich Islands. Meanwhile, the lady known as Mademoiselle St. Clair stood still as though she had been a statue of stone, and not a warm, breathing, boiling, living vengeance. Her dark face was stony, her hands clutched hard the rail of the bulwark. She never saw that face of grand rock where, by the continual hard winds from the thousand miles wide sea, the lime soda, as I have heard some wondrously clever people call it, is shaved as close as if a scythe had gone over it. She never saw the soft white patches of rock moss below. She never saw the narrow beach under the priest's cave. She never saw the eagle's nest rock, which the captain pointed out to interested passengers. She never saw that huge lamp where the watcher stood and watched the passing malvoisie above the wonderful mechanism of his revolving lights. She saw nothing around her. Her mind was occupied by the object she had spoken of. What was it? The malvoisie did not berth until the next morning, and when looking a perfect picture of English strength and manhood, Charlie Morris stepped to the pier. His hand was grasped by his friend Clements. Clements was a short, wiry, and rather gentlemanly-looking man, of, perhaps, Charlie Morris's age, and he was dressed in such an odd, loose style that Charlie stared at him, not being used to colonial attire, you see. Not that Morris himself had any pretensions to being a dandy. His attire was a simple suit of tweed, but then it was tweed which the first tailor in London had manipulated, and which, while being that of a perfect gentleman, gave full and easy play to his fine figure and perfect muscular development welcome to australia morris i am glad to see a schoolmate's face once more the australian said as he gripped the hand of his expected friend yet while he was speaking the sharp eyes were wandering over the numerous passengers landing and among the luggage being landed what the deuce is he staring about like that for thought charlie to himself i am rather afraid it's true what we heard about colonial manners but he only said aloud are you expecting any one else clements yes I don't know. Where are you going to put up? I advise Menzies. It's your style. You'll find any cabman will take you there. And still the sharp eyes roved restlessly through the noisy crowd. Well, I'm blowed, thought Charlie to himself. But he said coldly, Good morning, Mr. Clements. I dare say I've got a purse in my pocket. I shall be able to house myself in Victoria. Now come, Charlie, don't be a fool, cried Clements seizing him by the arm as he was moving away duty is duty you know and you mustn't expect here the same preux chevalier sort of manners you meet with on the continent i have another duty to perform here before i can devote myself entirely to you believe me i shall be at your service in the course of three quarters of an hour duty what do you mean clements in the name of all greenhorns didn't you know i'm a detective cried clements turning for one instant his wandering eyes on morris after that, I'm blowed. And then the sharp eyes resumed their watch. A detective, echoed Morris, and then he said no more aloud, but to himself. My schoolmate at rugby, and poor old Canon Clement's son. At this moment, stepped on the gangway of the Malvoisie, a small slender figure in deep mourning. She carried a valise of black American cloth in her hand, and she had a dark, foreign-looking, stony-like face. Clements advanced quickly as she stepped on the pier, and laid his hand lightly on her arm. "'You are Mademoiselle St. Clair?' he asked questioningly. "'Assuredly,' she answered haughtily. "'Take your hand from my arm, sir. "'I arrest you in the name of the Queen, Mademoiselle. "'You will please accompany me,' and he beckoned to two ready policemen. "'Arrest me!' The dark face flushed to deep scarlet. "'May I ask for what?' I arrest you on warrant of a charge of forgery, Clements answered, and I am bound to warn you that anything you may say will be used against yourself. Oh, mon Dieu, was all she said, as she fell against the rail of the gangway. But indignant Charlie Morris stepped forward and addressed Clements haughtily. Can nothing be done in this, sir? Can no bail be offered? None, my dear fellow. It is a charge of felony. If, cried Morris indignantly, 
I was such a one as you. I would kill myself. You are a hound. A sleuth hound, yes, Clements replied, as his prisoner was handed over to the charge of the policeman. And you might be glad of one on your track presently. I shall see you soon, Charlie Morris. Not if I know it, said Morris, as he turned to see his first of Melbourne. Good heavens! Before I'd come to that, I'd break stones. We are all liable to be désillusionné at times, and the day came when Charlie Morris was désillusionné as regarded the detective force of Victoria. It so happened that, on the morning of the arrival at the pier of the Malvoisie, two mounted men were getting ready to return to their stations. The name of one was Clem Penoyer, the name of the other Pat Fosbrook. At six in the morning they were busily engaged in currying and otherwise getting ready their several horses, and they were talking. "'If you'd thought much of your leg,' said Clem angrily, "'you'd be only too glad to have the use of it and go back to your station.' "'Me legs were a more use to me than ever yours were, Clem Penoyer, "'for I can shake em on a floor and you can't. "'But for all that I'd give the tops of me best toes "'to stop in Melbourne for the opening of the exhibition.' "'You're a fool,' simply replied Clem as he saddled his horse. "'Of course I am, and always was,' cried Pat. "'And what's more, I mean to be one as far as wishing for diversion's concerned. "'Now have you a word to say to that, Clem Penoyer?' "'The Irishman's attitude was suggestive. "'He had dropped the saddle and turned fiercely toward his mate, "'with one fist strangely near poor Clem's nose. "'I have no coats to waste trailing around Donnybrook Fair,' Clem said coolly. "'And you're a fool, Pat Fosbrook.' "'Be dad, I believe I am.' Pat said as he reduced his fist to the necessity of saddling his horse. But it's a good name anyway, and a name that a king needn't be ashamed of. At the same time, Clem Penoyer, it's a blank shame, just when we've had a chance of seeing fourteen emperors, twenty-four kings, and sixty-four knights of Jerusalem opening the great exhibition, I'm to be pulled back like an old drag to Tartura. Sure, I thought we'd be all on guard there. Mount your horse and get out of this. Clem cried angrily. Whoever has been stuffing your foolish head with such ideas beats me, but if I did know, I'd choke him. Fourteen emperors, twenty-four kings, and sixty-four knights of Jerusalem, repeated poor Pat, as he stuck one foot in the stirrup. If you say one more word, I'll report you, shrieked Clem, riding out of the gate. It's a fine name, that same Penoyer, Pat said as he followed him, but I'd rather be a Fosbrook and see fourteen emperors, twenty-four kings, and sixty-four knights of Jerusalem open the great Melbourne exhibition. "'Shut up!' Clem cried angrily, as he saw approaching them a handsome with a decided intention of visiting the Richmond depot. "'Devil I shut up, then,' Pat retorted. "'Sure, my leg's better anyhow.' "'Of all the fools!' Clem had begun, when the handsome pulled up suddenly. "'Is this the Richmond police depot?' a gentleman asked. A gentleman dressed in London cut tweed, and with a fair handsome face, as he quickly descended from the vehicle. "'Yes,' cried Penoya, abruptly, as he drew up his curvetting horse close to the vehicle. "'Yes, sir,' cried Pat Fosbrook, "'and it's here I got my leg broke with the kick of a horse, and was laid up in hospital for seven weeks. I'm blessed if they let me put my foot to the ground all the time, and more, betoken, my heel sore. But I wouldn't care, of course, if they let me see the opening of the great exhibition.' Fourteen emperors, twenty-four kings, sixty-four knights of Jerusalem. "'For heaven's sake, get back to quarters, Fosbrook,' Clem said as he dismounted. "'Excuse him, sir. I believe the man's mad.' "'What is the matter with him?' Charlie Morris asked. A strong, stalwart, breeze-blown English figure with a cigar between his fair moustached lips. "'The matter is simply, sir, that he's a fool, naturally so being an Irishman. He had, as he has told you, a kick from a horse about six weeks ago, and has been in our hospital. He used, it seems, to be the best step dancer at Tatura, and it seems to have fallen on his brain. Now his folly has taken a turn, and he wants to stop for the opening of the exhibition. Did you say Tatura? the young gentleman from England asked. Yes, he is stationed there, and is just on his way home to his station. Then I may say that my business here is accomplished, said our Charlie Morris. If you will be kind enough to ask Constable Fosbrook to permit me to accompany him to Tatura, I shall be more than grateful. Fourteen emperors, twenty-four kings, and sixty-four knights of Jerusalem, muttered Pat, but when he heard mention of Tatura, 
he drew up his horse close beside Charlie. Did you say Twetura, sir? Well, I'm your man, sure I'm going there, it's me station. We will go together, Charlie said with a smile, as he looked in the honest face of the Irishman, and it's quite possible that you and I might both yet see the opening of the Melbourne exhibition. Fourteen emperors, twenty-four kings, and sixty-four knights of Jerusalem, Pat said as he dismounted beside Charlie. Begora, it's myself that's glad to have company to Tatura. Can you dance a jig, sir? A real Irish jig. I think I can, constable. It'll go hard with me if we don't get up a jolly good dance at Tatura. To the devil I pitch ye all, Clem and emperors and kings and the rest of ye have Jerusalem. Pat shrieked in delight as he remounted his restive horse. Get in, sir, get in, sir, and I'll lay it all out for ye. Pat Fosbrook was not half such a fool as Clem Pennoy thought him. His advice as to Mr. Morris's best procedure was sound. At about two o'clock of that same day, two horsemen were within as many miles as Tatura. The horsemen were Charlie Morris and Pat Fosbrook. Now, sir, the latter said, pointing to a great southern slope of vineyard just gathering green from the warming sun. That's the place you're bound for. That's Tatura Vineyard. I think I shall go straight there. Morris said. Mr. Smallburn expects me. I wrote to him by the last mail. Do you think it probable that Mr. Smallburn will be at home? Devil a one of me thinks he's ever far from the cellar, Pat said. I'd lay an even bet that it's there you'll find him. In the cellar? What do you mean? The place where they keep the wine, Mr. Morris. Oh, you'll soon know all about it. Well, here's the gate. Would you like me to escort you up like? Oh, that will not be necessary, thank you and the township of Tatura. Is that it down there on the side of the hill? What a lovely place it is. Yes, sir, that's Tatura. And do you see that white place with all the green stuff around it? Well, that's the police station where I'm to be found most days of the week. For devil such a quiet place as Tatura you'll find in the colony, more's the pity. And do you see that brick house on the rise? Well, that's Vance's, the best drink, Mr. Morris, and the finest barmaid. "'And the place we are to have our dance, I see,' Charlie said, with one of his bright smiles, as they pulled up before a low, broad, white-painted gate. "'Well, Constable Fosbrook, get up the affair, and only let me know when it comes off. Make it as great a colonial success as you can. I give you carte blanche.' "'You'll give me what, sir?' asked Fosbrook, staring at Charlie with his mouth open. Morris laughed a hearty, genial laugh. I mean, my dear fellow, that you can arrange it all and come to me for the money you want. Ah, bedad, I understand that anyhow, cried Pat jubilantly as he slapped his leg. And you may believe me, Mr. Morris, that I won't let the grass grow under me feet about that same ball. Begor, you're a brick, sir. But honestly now, Mr. Morris, do you think my leg's much crooked? And he turned out the said limb and looked wistfully at it. "'Honestly, I do not see the least difference between the two, replied Charlie. "'I only hope it is quite strong enough to enjoy our prospective ball.' "'It's as sound as a trivet,' Pat cried. "'Would you like to see a step, Mr. Morris? "'E, Dad, if you would say the word, and I'll go down and give you one on the road.' Laughingly declining the compliment, Charlie rode through the gate Pat opened for him, and shut behind him, and they parted with mutual and sincere compliments. It may be well believed that to one fresh from the blue skies and thorn hedges of England, to ride up half a mile of avenue between trellises of lovely green vines, with the fresh air and budding verdure saluting his senses, and a sky blue as turquoise above his head, was a delightful experience to Charles Morris. Yet he was thinking so much of his old friend Smallburn, and so full of wonder at what change he should find in him, that he noticed little of the beauty around him. Soon he came in sight of the house, a pretty low stone house, with vine-wreathed verandas and porticos covered with a flush of roses. Behind, on the slope among the vines, were several other low stone buildings, one of which, though Charlie Morris did not know it, was the cellar. His arrival was observed, and a man came out to meet him, respectfully touching his hat as he approached. "'I am at Mr. Smallburn's place, am I not?' Morris asked. "'Yes, sir.' Is Mr. Smallburn at home? Mr. Smallburn? Yes, sir. Well, you can take my horse. If you will show me the way to Mr. Smallburn, I will go to him. I wish to take him by surprise. Yes, sir. 
are you the gentleman from england the master is expecting i am oh master will be delighted sir this way if you please sir past the rose-wreathed verandas and the long low venetian blinded windows of the house around which the stillness of the sunny spring day seemed to brood and up toward the cellar with its thick stone walls and slate roof mr morris followed his guide the door of this building was open and the man pointed to it you'll find mr smallburn inside sir with interested and wondering eyes charlie entered the building long ranges of great casks on trestles made as it were aisles are down the building and the pleasant freshness of cool air and the rich scent of wines greeted morris as he entered wondering where he should find his friend he travelled down one of the aisles and before he had proceeded far he saw lying upon a couch the figure of a sleeping man it was a strange place to choose for a couch or for rest under one of the ventilators that admitted light as well as air and in the shadow of a huge cask that held easily its thousand gallons of the blood of the grape the couch was placed close to it was drawn a small table on which were conspicuous several bottles with short and long necks and a tumbler or two the gentleman lying asleep was not tall but broad-chested and strong-limbed he had black hair and heavy eyebrows and he lay on his back with both hands under his head morris stood and looked at the strange changes barely seven years had made in his friend when he saw him last in an english home he was a pleasant pale-faced young man of twenty-four one of the best oarsmen and cricketers of his county he found him a besotted-looking man of more than his age and with a hard ferocious look on even his sleeping face he moaned and muttered in his sleep and started and ground his teeth so that charlie felt it a charity to awaken him he laid his hand on smallburn's arm and slightly shook him the sleeper started almost to his feet at one bound and he trembled from head to foot like a leaf in the wind he stared at charlie as though he had been a ghost until at last his scattered senses collected themselves and he saw a strange gentleman before him good heavens how you startled me he exclaimed as he fell back into a sitting posture to the couch and wiped the big drops from his forehead i must have been dreaming you were indeed morris said quietly i thought it a kindness to awaken you smallburn poured out a great tumbler of wine from one of the bottles on the table and drank it at a draught then he pushed bottles and glasses towards charlie as he begged him to be seated pray help yourself sir you'll find it the very best blood of the grape i don't know what's come over me but i'm getting as nervous as a woman charlie thought he could guess and was deeply grieved but said nothing as he seated himself on one end of the couch and presently smallburn turned and stared into his face send i may live if it isn't charlie morris he cried i was only half awake you see and i thought you were some stranger welcome to tatura my dear fellow the welcome was hearty the grip of the hand tight the man's heart was not quite dead within him his dull eyes gleamed momentarily no doubt the sight of charlie's face brought with it some memories of his lost youth the two old friends sat and talked long of old days and old friends and gradually the questions were put and answered until they drifted more into personalities how is it you never married charlie morris blushed like a girl i was very near it a few years ago but she jilted me i shall never care for another woman were you so very fond of her then old boy i was caleb so fond that if it had not been for my good dear mother i believe i should have destroyed myself for a woman like that why she was not worth it charlie i suppose not but we can't help such follies of our youth i suspect that all men are fools at times especially where a woman is concerned yes cursed fools smallburn said with energy i have never but once regretted my marriage but it has been every hour and day since i was such a fool you married morris said opening his great grey eyes on his friend why this is the first i've heard of it is it i thought i had written of it well it's nothing to be proud of anyway i made a mistake that has ruined me charlie's face looked as he felt truly grieved he began to understand why his old friend lay under the shadow of the great cask and why his hand shook like an old man's as he raised glass after glass to his lips 
of course he was too thoroughly honourable to ask one question but smallburn went on she is an extravagant flirt he said and she's worse she married me for my money and she's told me so a hundred times lately she never cared one rap for me there's some other chap at home that she's fond of to this day and here she's never satisfied without a half a dozen men breaking their hearts for her is mrs smallburn handsome morris asked absently you can see for yourself smallburn replied sulkily there she goes with her latest admirer by blank he added with a fierce clench of his fists and a lurid light in his eye patience has its limits and they'd better look out charlie looked toward the open door of the cellar a broad patch of sunshine lay among the unshaded vines and through the vines and the sunshine on a broad avenue rode a lady on horseback her figure in its plain beautifully fitting habit of dark cloth was perfection itself but as her face was turned toward her attentive cavalier morris could not see it as they passed to the cellar the gentleman with her turned a quick glance within it and then a woman's merry laugh rang among the vines smallburn ground his teeth again let us go in he cried starting to his feet we dine early and i'd like to be about just now again the long-necked bottle was taxed and with reluctant steps morris accompanied his host into the house once there smallburn himself showed charlie to his room and left him telling him he would come back for him in half an hour at the advice of his friend fosbrook mr morris had brought with him a small valise strapped before him on the saddle a larger one was to come up by coach that evening pat had made him acquainted with the habits of tatura in his own emphatic and not over choice luggage and he was aware that his valise would supply all his requirements dress for dinner is it cried pat dress when you get up in the morning and on dress when you go to bed and that's all any one else does up there when morris entered the drawing-room in his host's company he found there only the gentleman who had escorted mrs smallburn home mr smallburn made short ceremony of the introduction and just at that moment a lady entered a lady of twenty-five with a handsome proud face a haughty curl of the lip and dark languishing eyes that could flush fire at will she swept her long train into the room and paused to be introduced to the gentleman from england of whose arrival her husband had informed her charlie morris turned to meet his hostess and lifted his pleasant grey eyes to her face then a sudden flush of crimson dyed his face up to the very roots of his fair hair mrs smallburn grew white as dead ashes and staggered a little then she recovered herself as suddenly and bowed to charlie i have great pleasure in welcoming mr morris to tatura she said and no more for her white trembling lips refused to utter more caleb smallburn watching the two faces suspiciously felt himself shudder as though some one were walking over his grave that was to be what was the reason of charlie's blush what was the reason of his wife's pallor it was but a wretched attempt at conversation during dinner for all at table were ill at ease and consumed by some of the most powerful passions of our nature if at that moment when they left the house after dinner to return with smallburn's wish to the cellar one or other had spoken out the thoughts of his mind all might have been well but none of the thoughts were spoken charlie thought i should like to tell poor caleb yet how can i it is her secret not mine smallburn thought what is there between them ah i'll find out when they had smoked a cigar or two and drank some blood of the grape out of the long-necked bottles in the cellar charlie plucked up courage if you wouldn't mind caleb he said i should like to ride over to the station and see constable fosbrook about that ball i promised to pay all expenses you know and i shouldn't like to disappoint the honest fellow of course you can have any horse you like out of the stables caleb said sulkily but it seems to me that considering you only came a few hours ago you're in a blessed funk to get away from me couldn't you come too charlie asked with a strange nervousness for such broad shoulders and strong muscles well no smallburn replied after a pause there's a visitor too many inside i think i'd rather stop at home but don't mind me old fellow go and see your policeman the permission was not very gracious but charlie was too anxious to get away from tatura to be particular as he rode down through the vines and toward the township fosbrook had pointed out 
his big honest heart was heavy with a sorrow which did not belong to him and he would have given a good many of the hundreds he possessed that it had so happened he had never seen tatara reaching the police station he tied his horse to the white palings and opening the gate entered there he paused for from the sounds within he learned his friend fosbrook had company he could hear another voice than fosbrook's but his new friend was still harping on the old theme i wouldn't have missed it for a month's pay sir the likes of it'll never be seen again in this colony or any other fourteen emperors twenty-four kings and sixty-four knights of jerusalem there'd be a sight man sure if a man had seen it he wouldn't want to see no more in this world oh begorra here's mr morris and the honest chap bounced from his seat to receive his most welcome visitor picture to yourself the perfect astonishment of charlie morris on perceiving that fosbrook's other visitor was his old schoolmate clements and the present detective morris drew back as he was entering but clements started up and drew him in by the arm if i didn't know you better than you know yourself you great easy soft-hearted charlie morris i should be offended you wouldn't have minded me being a detective one bit if i haven't arrested that lady fellow passenger of yours now you needn't colour up you know it's true if i had said to you charlie morris i'm not proud of my employment but though i was a schoolmate of yours at rugby there was nothing else open to me and i must live in spite of what old rochefoucault said you know you'd have been the very last to call me a hound now wouldn't you we may easily guess what the answer of our big-hearted charlie would be to such a question as that so leaving him to try and discover clement's object in following him to tartara and find out what had become of mademoiselle st clair as well as settle with fosbrook all about the forthcoming ball let us go back to tartara when the sun was hidden behind the western line of tree-clad hills and the shadows of evening were deeper in the cellars of tartara mr smallbone lay upon the couch where morris had found him he had seen his wife's friend depart and told such a piece of his mind to the said wife that she had trembled with a provision of terror to the bottom of her weak heart then he returned to his favourite retreat among the great casks of his beloved blood of the grape and resigned himself to the solution of that problem so interesting to him what secret is it between these two the long-necked bottles were very near the shadows were growing deeper he lay in his usual attitude on his back with both hands clasped under his head he thought the problem out with the fumes of the malvoisie in his brain and the perfume of the great casks around him the one under which he lay bulged out its great bulk over him would it have been better that it had burst and deluged out his life like poor clarence's in the tower all at once the problem was solved charlie morris was the man she loved a thousand times better than him in england i have it he cried aloud as he started convulsively to his feet in the growing darkness i have it what have you caleb smallburn a sarcastic voice asked so close to him that he fell back on the couch what have you got malvoisie hermitage Shiraz, bordeaux pray share with a friend he dared not speak was it one of his own wine-born visions of some mocking fiend he trembled until the big drops grew again on his forehead and listened what not one word of welcome for an old friend caleb not one word are you dead you shall be dead some day you know ah it was some mocking fiend of his dreams if he could only catch hold of one of those long-necked bottles he would soon drive that away he put out his hand and groped in the darkness and his hand was gripped by another cold and icy as death with the desperation of terror he seized and held the hand and then a ripple of low mocking laughter rang through the cellar he knew where a silver sconce hung close to his head when it pleased him to smoke and drink there at night so still holding fast the hand which did not seek to free itself he struck with the other a match against the wall and lit the wax light in the sconce the wick caught gleamed and burned up there was silence in the cellar and then with a wildly beating heart smallburn turned and looked at his prisoner what he saw in the face of a woman whose hand he held made him drop the small hand as though it had been hot iron on the opposite side of the table stood a graceful woman with black hair and a dark complexioned stony face she was simply dressed in black carried a small valise of american cloth in her hand it was mademoiselle st clair of the steamer malvoisie you he cried you yes i mon cher are you not glad to welcome your darling home 
Mais non. I suppose not, since you had me arrested even before I put my foot on your Australian ground. But you see, my dear, you did not, for I easily proved the forged cheque was a real one you had lovingly sent me all the way from France. What do you mean? he asked, as he stared with eyes whose fury would have terrified another woman. Nothing of you at present, mon cher, save to let you know that when you are dead, fair Tatura will be mine. It's a lovely heritage, my love, and it will be a pleasant change to me to find myself mistress of Tatura. May I say au revoir, or shall it be adieu pour jamais? He never replied, but the look of fury in his eyes deepened and grew more lurid. But Mademoiselle Sinclair was not afraid of him. She laughed in his face kissed her hand to him, and glided away in the darkness of the cellar. As Charlie Morris returned from his visit to Fosbrook, just as night was falling, a girl glided from the veranda and put a note into his hand. Charlie was a great coward so far as the fair sex were concerned, and he would rather have met a shower of mitraille than have received that note. He guessed from whom it came, and trembled at what he saw before him. It was his firm determination to leave Tartara on the next day, no matter what a rupture it might occasion with Caleb. He read the note by the light of a stable lantern, as he pretended to be deeply interested about the proper care of the valuable horse he had ridden. It was short, but like the writer, firm as death. I must see you alone. It is quite useless for you to refuse, unless you wish to render all the life of your schoolmate unhappy. At eleven o'clock tonight I shall await you in the vines at the south side of the cellar. Charlie pushed the note into his pocket. He looked wistfully at the horse he had ridden from town, standing contentedly in his stall, and he thought, should he have him saddled and go there and then? But it would look so bad, and there was poor Fosbrook's ball. He went out and walked quickly in the darkness toward the cellar. The light still burned in the silver sconce over Smallburn's head, and he himself sat upon the couch, with a hand gripping either knee. All the long-necked bottles were empty, but there were millions of gallons in the long aisles of the cellar. He looked up as Morris came within the small circle of light, but he did not first speak. "'Are you not well, Caleb? You do not look well. What is the matter?' "'I've been drinking more than's good for me. Never mind me.' "'But I do mind you, old fellow. Rouse up and come into the air.' "'Let me alone,' Smallburn said so doggedly, that as he had done on the Malvoisie when his offer of service was so curtly received, Charlie did here. He turned on his heel and walked away. He had drawn out his handkerchief as he stood by the little table, and he left behind him, gleaming white on the dark floor of the cellar, a scrap of folded paper. Caleb Smallburn saw the object with stupid eyes, but at last he rose lazily and picked it up. He staggered as he did so, and recovered himself with an effort. He had no more idea of the value of that bit of paper than that it might be a memorandum of Morris's. Yet it was worth a human life. It was the note Charlie had just received. Smallburn recognised the writing at a glance. As he read it, he knew what the devil had been tempting him all night for. A blaze of fierce passion ran up to the roots of his black hair and almost grew purple, as he once again staggered like a blind man. For a moment, the long rows of casks, which were the wealth of Tatterer, grew like a dream to his eyes. He could not see the light in the silver sconce or the silver gleam on the long necks of the empty bottles. At last that terrible purple shade left his face, and gradually he shook himself together. There was not an echo of even a whisper in the cellar, but he went out in the darkness and entered his own room by the window. Charlie Morris strolled through the vines in the darkness, smoking a cigar, the perfume of which did not yet prevent him from inhaling the delightful aroma of growing verdure and fresh air. He was determined not to enter the house without its master, and we know in what terms he had been dismissed by Smallburn. It was growing late, yet not more than ten o'clock, and he was just tossing away his cigar with the determination of riding down to get a bed at the township when a woman's voice fell softly on his ear. "'I have forestalled the time, Charlie,' I feared you would not meet me. Your fear was well founded, madam. I was just on my way to the stables for a horse. I could not stay another night under the roof of a friend whose wife has so forgotten herself. Oh, don't talk so, Charlie. Have you so entirely forgotten the dear old days? I have always loved you, and always will, and you needn't talk to me of a husband whom I hate, 
a sot a drunkard who is never in his sober senses from one year's end to the other could one whom you have once loved ever love such a thing as that charlie drew himself away from her persistently clinging hand just as the big moon rose roundly over the vineyard and threw her cold beams aslant the vines when the wretched woman had left her home for the last time she had not seen a dark figure dogging her soft steps she had not seen a shadow darker than the vine behind which it hid when she spoke to charlie morris but the moon saw it as she rose and she saw too a gleam of her own light on the barrel of a revolver there was a report on the still air a shriek and an oath and julia smallburn lay on the soft fresh earth a bleeding dying woman so much for you traitress and i have a barrel left yet shouted the murderer of tatterer as he took aim at the horrified charlie but at that instant the weapon was knocked from his hand and he was felled to the ground by a blow from a strong arm the blow came from the arm of clements the detective the woman was dying that was evident even in the light of the rising moon the bullet had penetrated her chest she was beyond all human aid before they had time even to raise her head she was gone where ah what one of you dares to answer that question they wondered why caleb smallburn never attempted to rise he lay as the blow of clements had felt him with his eyes wide open staring at the moon and his breath coming in hard quick pants fosbrook was there now he was under clements orders and he raised the vigneron from the ground roughly and tried to stand him on his feet haven't you a leg another you our friend fosbrook asked as he administered a good shake but faith i don't wonder at it murther and villain stand up i say i can't the wretched man said oh what ails me oh what is the matter with me take me to the cellar it was quite evident that he was ill strong spasms of pain shook him from head to foot and made him writhe like a crushed worm they carried him into the cellar and laid him on his favourite couch where with all the great casks of his beloved blood of the grape around him he drew his last breath of the bouquet of wine as the last spasm of pain died out of his unconscious limbs a hollow laugh sounded in the recesses of the cellar be gob you're all right clements whispered fosbrook she's here shut the door clements flew to the door and closed it while fosbrook seized one of the many lights some of the terrified servants had brought in and ran toward that part of the cellar from whence had come that horrible laugh they had not far to seek crouching in a corner of the cellar among the long aisles of great casks they found mademoiselle sinclair with her black eyes blazing and her black hair wildly dishevelled she clapped her hands at the sight of light and faces and sprang to her feet i'm the lady of tatura she cried i'm the mistress of all the green vines the devil you are said fosbrook cruelly i told you she was mad clements whispered as he led her toward the couch she was his wife the servants around whispered she was his real wife and he left her in france poor thing no wonder she went mad is that caleb asked the mad woman how ugly he is cover him up and bury him i told him he would die but he did not believe me ah you pretty bottles ah you cunning bottles how nicely you swallowed the little white crystals in the dark i am the lady of tatura yes that was the secret when one cold hand had been gripped in that of her false husband the other had in the dark poisoned his wine the last drop of malvoisie he drank had contained deadly poison alas to how many of us is every drop we are foolish enough to drink poison both to body and soul let us escape all the dread details consequent on the double tragedy at tatterer and follow poor saddened charlie morris to melbourne in company with clements and fosbrook the latter had in charge the poor maniac mademoiselle sinclair who is now in the yarra bend asylum and on the interest of charlie with headquarters he was permitted to remain in town for the opening of the exhibition he duly attended the same and was disgustingly disappointed where's the fourteen emperors he asked and where's the twenty-four kings and where's the sixty-four knights of jerusalem devil a one of me sees anything more than you'd see at any day in dublin ah my honest friend replied charlie 
you'll find out that there are better things in the world than emperors and kings or even knights of jerusalem faith i believe you cried fosbrook i had as fine a dance at the casino below last night as heart could wish for and every one told me leg was as straight as it ever was long may good fosbrook dance independent of kings or emperors and when charlie goes to his happy english home on the next voyage of the stout seabird malvoisie may time have soothed his sad memories of tatura end of story Section 9 of Stories from the Detectives Album by Wife Wonder, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. The Gutter Flag A Tale of the Green Hills. So many visitors to our exhibition will read the Australian Journal during their stay in the city, which is the result mainly of those wonderful gold fields from which we unearthed our treasures that I think I had better make this a tale of the old digging days when I was a mounted policeman and not a detective. Coming from distant lands, where they will have, doubtless, read strange and but little understood narratives of our great rushes, where thousands of miners dug up gold in lumps like potatoes, they will see the trophy representing our finds in the exhibition building they have passed so many thousands of miles of dangerous ocean to see and wonder how and under what circumstances we gathered it in. Let me tell them a story of the Green Hills Rush. It was Saturday evening one night in November, so far back as 1856, and, being stationed in the Green Hills Rush, I had just ridden in from duty at the Buninyong station. The long double line of tents that formed the so-called street gleamed white in the low sunbeams, and every one of the hundreds of flags that decorated or identified almost every tent place of business were flicking and fluttering in the welcome sea breeze which had just reached us with its usual punctuality from hobson's bay in many a dancing saloon the music was already in full swing though the dancing had not yet commenced and every store and restaurant had many diggers within their canvas balls enjoying the relaxation of sunday afternoon and spending their gold Allen's store was the nearest to the Buninyong end of the street, and a place I always dropped into when I had an opportunity. Allen himself was a shrewd Yankee who minded his own business and minded it well. He heard all people had to say, and said little himself, while he looked sharply after the almighty dollar. Nevertheless, Allen's was one of the best places on the Green Hills for hearing all the news of the diggings, for Allen could talk when he knew who he was talking to. Drink was sold everywhere in those days in spite of law, and I should not care to say how many tips the traps received to hold their tongues and shut their eyes concerning the matter. I know I never paid a shilling for a nobbler while I was on the gold fields, and being especially partial to claret, with two or three big lumps of sugar, not the kind they are so fond of in Parliament, you know, in each tumbler, I got as much as I chose to drink of it for nothing. Several men were standing at the counter drinking as I entered, and, as was my habit, passed through to Allen's little private compartment behind. Among these men, the noisiest and loudest was known as Wild Sam, a drunken vicious chap with fair hair and red whiskers, who was one of four mates working a deep shaft just at the back of our camp. He was blowing about their vicinity to the gutter, and prophesying that their claim would be one of the richest on the green hills. "'But I've blank bad mates,' he added with an oath. That cursed young Burke is on my shift, and he makes a regular practice of leaving the windlass for an hour at a time every night, nearly, while I'm kicking my heels below for want of the bucket. That's a rum sort of go, returned one of the listeners. What does he go for? Drink? Drink, cried Wild Sam, with a loud haw-haw laugh. Not it. He goes to meet that girl of Clavers that all the diggers are crazy after. Ah, she's a beauty of a sly one, that mate's. "'Twas me yesterday, and now tis Burke. Lord knows who it'll be next. Dan here, perhaps. And a chorus of coarse laughter greeted this witticism, for the Dan alluded to was a hunchback and a most repulsive-looking object. I had the curiosity to climb up the shaft last night to see what my lad was after, and there, not a stone's throw from the poppet heads, I sees my hardy Burke a kissin' and huggin' that modest Miss Dorothy Clovers at eleven o'clock at night among the shafts. 
a sudden silence that seemed to have fallen on the men around him as quick glances were turned toward the door made sam turn and look also a handsomely built man of about thirty with dark hair and beard and large grey heavy lashed eyes was standing in the wide doorway he was dressed in the usual digger's costume of the day moleskin trousers light crimean shirt and wide awake felt hat his fine eyes were flashing with anger and his fists clenched as he strode toward sam who is that you are letting your vile ignorant and lying tongue loose upon sam markley he asked in tones his fierce passion rendered tremulous oh you needn't take the young lady's part mate was the sarcastic reply you're an old bloke of hers but you may believe me she's thrown you over as well as me a girl that meets chaps in the middle of the night but sam did not conclude his sentence a strong blow went out straight from dave drew's shoulder and sam fell to the ground literally as though he had been shot the men drew back and not one showed a symptom of interfering sam was no favourite among the diggers and dave drew was if you want any more you cowardly defamer of women get up and get it cried drew and wild sam struggled to his feet the blood was pouring from his nose and one eye was already swollen and black i'll be revenged for this dave drew if i should hang for it he exclaimed as he dashed the blood from his face with one hand and threatened his mate with the other i dare say you will if i let you retorted drew and now let me hear of your saying one word such as i heard you say a minute ago about dorothy clavers and i'll hammer you out of all semblance of humanity and dave went out into the street with all the blood in his body at fever heat with rage and annoyance he went up the street at a sharp pace heedless of the noise around him and taking but little notice of the many hearty cooees shouted to him from the doors of business places he passed every one liked dave and if he had chosen he could have been intoxicated every hour of the twenty-four at his friend's expense reaching at last claver's store which had its name on a great strip of calico stretched across the end of the tent in big black letters on white ground he turned into the store and advanced to the counter dorothy claver's was seated behind it a fair pretty-faced innocent-looking girl of eighteen she was slightly bent to one side from weakness of the spine in childhood but the deformity if deformity it could be called only rendered her more interesting in the eyes of those who loved her she was sewing a great big g of turkey cotton on a square of strong white calico and as dave entered she blushed consciously and rose see what i'm doing dave she said in a soft low voice i'm making a new gutter flag the old one is in pieces and i want your claim to look gay we haven't struck gold yet dorothy he replied as he helped himself to something from a bottle on the counter for he was shaking like a leaf and we never may oh yes i'm sure you will dave rollo thinks you're not far off the bottom now as she spoke the fair face grew perfectly scarlet the young man looked sadly at the downcast blushing face and then he spoke it was to speak about burke that i came in dorothy and i'm lucky to have found you alone dorothy you know how unselfishly i have loved you and that it can be no envy of my more fortunate mate which induces me to warn you of exhibiting anything like secrecy in meeting him i heard statements made to-day of you and him that made me mad for a moment it is terrible to hear the name of a girl you love in the mouths and ears of coarse men i hope to god it was not true but if you have dear dorothy in your innocence and love been imprudent enough to meet burke in the lead never do it again as you value your own good name and the peace of mind of a father and mother who love you dearly he turned on his heel as he spoke generously wishing to spare the poor girl a witness of her humiliation and dorothy was left alone she crept into a corner behind the counter where some barrels upon it hid her partially and she threw the gutter flag over her face it was well that poor dave did not hear her heavy bitter sobs for they would have broken his good heart she knew that she was safe from the watchful eye of maternal love for her mother had driven herself into balignong and her father was putting up a little building at the back where she could hear his hammer going steadily as she wept she was not however permitted to indulge her tears long in peace a hateful voice called out miss dorothy lovely lady dorothy the poor girl snatched the gutter flag from her head and there bending over the counter and looking around the barrels was the swollen and bruised face of wild sam 
she almost shrieked so hideously ugly did he appear with the unwashed blood drying on his countenance and red beard and the black swollen bruises around his eyes drawing back as far as she could dorothy stared at sam in undisguised terror and disgust and the brute's red eyes flashed viciously as he saw the movement and expression i am a handsome chap now eh miss dorothy but not half such a good-looking fellow as my mate rollo burke eh wouldn't come down to the claim to meet me in the middle of the night eh well hearken my dear the day'll come when you'll be glad to meet me ay and do anything i ask you to do you hear i got this pretty face from your old bloke dave drew all on your account and i'll be revenged on the lot of you if i hang for it you are a bad man cried dorothy with desperation as she threw the gutter flag over her head to hide sam's horrible face from her eyes you're a wretch go away or i'll call my father you'll call him one day when he won't hear my dear is that the new flag you're making for our shaft what a nice face cloth it would make for a dead girl dorothy snatched the gutter flag from her head in horror at the awful insinuation of wild sam but when she ventured to peep around the barrels the shop was empty sam had disappeared the terrified girl looked at the bit of white cloth with its red letter as it lay on her lap and she shuddered as though a cold wind had passed over her to her nervously disordered vision the big g got blurred into a red patch like a blood-stain or stared at her as the initial of the word grave hurriedly folding the flag up she placed it on one of the shelves in the shop and hurried out to call her father feeling really afraid to stop there any longer but she did not tell him one word of wild sam or his threats as dave drew left the store with a sad heart for he had loved this gentle girl dearly and the knowledge that her name was in the mouths of vile and heartless men grieved him sorely a sturdy old man with a little rough terrier trotting after him was coming up the street he was an odd-looking old chap tall and gaunt with keen eyes under shaggy grey brows and a short grizzled beard on his chin and around his firm pursed-up obstinate-looking mouth he had on moleskins of a peculiar brown dyed in wattle bark by his own hands a funny-looking jumper gathered around his waist with a drawing-string and hanging in bags all around his spare figure while to crown all he had a great broad-crowned cap with a band and a no peak made of white tent canvas by his own fingers drawn tightly down over his forehead until not a hair of his grey head was visible save at the back where a few long straggling locks escaped and hung down over the collar of the jumper he carried a pick over his shoulder with a shovel suspended from it over his back and a black billy in the other hand well dave he said as the other joined him and walked by his side you're at claver's again why man i thought you had more sense than to go there like a silly moth and get the remains of your wings singed again i had to go daddy the young man said in reply i could not help it but you need not fear for me my good old friend i shall not tempt the fire again I know it would be useless. How goes the sinking on the green hill? I think I'll bottom tomorrow, the old man replied in a mysterious whisper. I'm down on the pipe clay, and see, what is that? They had left the street, and were going up the hill towards a white tent about fifty yards from the working deep shafts, when old Daddy Lawson swung pick and shovel from his shoulder, and unhooked the pick from the handle of the shovel. What does it look like, Dave, my boy? what does that look like that was the point of the pick that on one of its smooth sides gleamed as though it had been gilded dave took the tool in his hand and examined it closely i should say it's been through a nugget daddy ay so should i lad but how big is it i'd have bottomed before i came home but didn't want to leave it bare and the sun is low but oh man how i wish twas to-morrow i hope it'll be a good claim for your sake dave my boy that shaft of yours has been a hard pull on us on you daddy i had nothing to lose but i wouldn't take a penny more from you if you got a hundred weight if this claim of ours below here doesn't strike the gutter i'll be off with my swag back to chinaman's flat no you won't my boy we're mates you and i we agreed on all that long ago i was to find the working expenses and half of your share is mine when you strike the gutter and half of my gold in the shallow sinking yonder is dave drew's but dave drew has not found any expenses for your shallow sinking daddy what has he done to earn half of your share they had reached the tent 
and old daddy tossed his pick and shovel on the ground as he laid his hand on the firm shoulder of the young miner you've made an old man happier than he's been for twenty years my son you've given him an interest in a life that was a burden to him and you must not forsake him now and leave him to his loneliness again no no trip and me couldn't do without dave could we trip and the little dog jumped and barked around them both as if she really understood that the question was one involving both their interests dave pressed the old man's hand hard but he could not speak in spite of his fine form and stout muscles he had a heart as soft as a good woman's he bent to caress the little dog to hide a suspicious glistening of his fine dark eyes he did not feel a choking in his throat when he felled wild sam to the ground for speaking evil of the girl who had refused the wealth of his faithful love and arm strong to shelter and protect but he was incapable of speech through strong emotion now when he heard in the affectionate tremulous tones of an old man that he loved him and trip too why with an old friendless man to comfort and a faithful dog to caress he could not be altogether unhappy even though a simple pretty girl had refused him the treasure of her heart he loved his young mate rollo burke too and in the greatness of his unselfish soul believed him far more suitable to pretty dorothy than a great rough fellow such as he was would have been if she was only happy that was all he asked if she was only always happy that was all he asked he was thinking so as he raked together the stalwart embers against the big fallen tree where they had prepared their morning meal while the active old daddy brought a fresh billy of water up from the river lee the black fellow's yarrowee and slung it over the fire when the supper was ready they sat on the grass and ate it eating their chops off tin plates and drinking their tea out of tin pannikins while the murmur and music and shouts and laughter of a saturday night on the diggings came up the hill to their ears only subdued by distance and the rustling of branches above them as the sea breeze freshened on the quiet hillside and dave told his old friend all about his encounter with sam and its cause and daddy shook his head as he listened here's a man i never liked and never could trust that wild sam the old man said but he's your mate and it's bad quarrelling among mates that you can't get rid of still i don't see that you could help it i think a man must be a cur indeed that will stand by and listen to any woman's character being taken away by a cowardly liar but if it's true lad if it's true i hope to heaven it is not and i have warned poor dorothy i think daddy that if you were to speak to burke he might take it better than from me he is a soft innocent young chap but not over clever i'm sure he loves dorothy as well as it is in his nature to love and would not willingly harm a hair on her head will you speak to him to-morrow daddy of course you need not say i laid you on as he might not take it so well ay ay i see but why not to-night the sooner a good thing is done the better rollo and his two or three more are going out possuming to-night daddy you'd better leave it till to-morrow you'll see him at his tent we change shifts to-night i go on at eight so i must be off well lad i'll have a bit of supper ready for you when you come home at twelve so be sure and come straight from the shaft oh you may be sure of that daddy and dave meant what he said but for all that he did not come straight home from the shaft about an hour later when the full moon was showing her big round face over the hill opposite claver's store rollo burke with three or four other young men one of whom was wild sam entered the store claver's was busy it being saturday night and both mrs claver's and dorothy were assisting behind the counter the young miner on whom poor dorothy had bestowed her affections was a handsome fair youth of twenty-one with blue soft eyes and the lithe supple figure of a young antinous he carried a gun as did indeed all of his companions and exchanged a loving glance with blushing dorothy at the moment of entrance wild sam hung a little back at first but on being addressed by clavers went boldly forward to the counter behind which the girl had wept in the evening and his first glance after it had swept sinisterly over dorothy rested on the gutter flag she had laid on one of the shelves after his horrible association of it with a face cloth for the dead hello are you bound for a possum raid asked clavers why sam marksley what's the matter with your face sam laughed harshly as he went forward to the counter oh a few love marks i got on account of a certain young lady 
and he glanced quickly from the gutter flag to Dorothy's now pale face again. Clavis had heard nothing of the scene between Dave and Sam at Allen's. Of course he was not likely to hear, as his own daughter was so concerned in it. But he knew Sam's temper, and seeing that he did not wish to be questioned, attended to his orders from other members of the party to be supplied with ammunition for their expected sport. The young miner, Rollo Burke, had heard nothing of it either, for the same reason, doubtless, and Sam had accounted to him for his bruised face by stating that he had stumbled and fallen in getting down from the elevated mouth of their own shaft. So, paying little attention to what was going on around him, Rollo, affecting to require a pocket-handkerchief very badly, selected one from Dorothy, and whispered to her all the time. "'We'll be home early, Dorothy. You'll come out at eleven and give me three sweet words, won't you, darling?' "'Oh, Rollo, I can't. We've been seen, and I've done very wrong. Oh, no, you mustn't never expect me again.' "'Never expect you again? What do you mean, dearest Dorothy? Surely, surely you're not going to throw me over now. I can't live without you, and I won't. If you give me up, I'll die. You must let me see you alone, darling, or I will not live to endure it.' He spoke vehemently, and the young, fair, handsome face flushed. Rollo's soft blue eyes were half full of tears as Dorothy met them for an instant, and then drooped. No wonder Dave had called him soft, and not over clever. A needless duplication, by the way, for clever people are rarely soft. "'I am not going to give you up, Rollo. You know I love you, and always shall,' she whispered softly. "'But I cannot meet you secretly again. Have you not heard?' And then remembering that Wild Sam was present, and what a quarrel the truth might engender, she stopped suddenly. "'Remember what? I remember nothing but that I must speak to you some time or I shall die.' "'You must speak to father,' she said softly. "'You know I would have done so long ago, Dorothy, darling, if we had bottomed on the gutter, but we are certain to do so, sooner or later, and then I may have a chance with your father. Now I have none. Meanwhile you must try and be content with seeing me in the store, dear Rollo. See, here is mother coming.' Take your handkerchief and go. But for my sake, Rollo, take care of yourself to-night. I am afraid of those guns. God bless, my love. I shall take care, dear. My life is valuable to me now that I am assured of your love. While this low-toned conversation was being carried on over a box of handkerchiefs, Wild Sam was not idle. Half-seated on the counter, over which he had terrified poor Dorothy, he held his gun between his knees with one hand, while with the other he affected to toy with the yardstick, which Mrs. Clavers had left lying upon the counter before the drapery shelves. He had paused to watch Dorothy after he left the store earlier in the day, and recognised the horror with which she had folded and put away the gutter flag, that flag for a purpose of his own he was bent upon gaining possession of. Watching his opportunity, he deftly inserted the end of the yardstick into the folds of the flag, and with a quick movement twitched it to the counter. In another moment it was hidden in his breast, and his immediate purpose was accomplished just as the party, noisily gay and full of spirit, left the store and emerged into the broad moonlit street, outlined as it seemed to be with huge calico lanterns through the unlined sides of which the forms of billiard players or gyrating dancers were plainly visible. I myself was standing at the door of the police camp as the party came chatting and laughing down the moonlit street. They saw me and stopped. "'Come on for an hour's possuming, Sinclair,' one of the chaps said. "'I know Smith's in the camp, so you have no excuse.' "'Yes, Smith is here, and I'll go. But I mustn't be long, as I have to go up the street on duty,' I replied. "'Oh, we're all going up the street,' another said laughingly. "'We'll give the possums an hour or so only. I'm bound for a dance at Max tonight.' "'And I, and I,' was the cry. "'And I.' said Rollo Burke, also, for Max was opposite Clavers, you see, and if he could not speak to Dorothy, he could at least watch her passing to and fro in the store, and if luck favoured him, perhaps get a chance to exchange a word with her during her parents' temporary absence. The green hill to which we were bound lay almost close to the diggings, and rested, soft-looking and beautiful, in the night's full flood of moonlight. The rest of a perfect stillness and peace seemed to lay with the moonlight, upon its rich green sward, and the grand old trees that stood in hushed repose around its rounded top. 
what a contrast between the calm of nature on the green hill slope we ascended and the light and noise of the goldfield below in the lead many of the sailor miners sang in unison as they worked the windlass while in occasional pauses could be heard repeated from a dozen shafts the warning look out below as the bucket descended the crash of brass bands mingled with loud shouts of laughter came up to us as one or two of us paused about halfway up the smooth ascent to get breath and look at the strange scene presented by the tortuous and strangely illuminated street below i should like to have a little cottage up here said rollo softly how pleasant it is and how peaceful the poor lad was doubtless thinking of a little home with pretty dorothy for its love light you may easily get that if you bottom on the gutter as every one thinks you will i returned and i have often remembered since how almost unearthly beautiful the youth's really handsome face looked with the pale moonlight on it and a smile of hope and happiness wreathing his perfectly curved lips it was a grand night for possum shooting and they were plentiful among the old trees on the green hill soon our little party were scattered while each man searched with a keen eye the giant branches between him and the moonlit sky while shot after shot began to crack and echo in the clear air under the old trees when i had at last dropped my own possum which had even in death clung to its branch with its curled tail and refused to be dislodged until i shattered the said tail with the contents of another barrel i saw rollo burke at but a little distance holding his gun by the barrel while its butt rested on the grass as he gazed up sideways toward a branch far above his head sam marksley was standing near him apparently watching the same game all this i saw in a moment ere i stooped to lift my dead possum and as i stooped a shot and a cry that seemed to be simultaneous raised me again instantly to see rollo lying upon the grass with sam marksley bending over him oh my god he's shot the latter shouted sinclair harry tom come for the love of heaven rollo's shot being the nearest i was first by the side of the wounded youth he was lying almost on his face with a discharged gun just dropped from his outstretched left hand from under his left ear a rapid red stream was pouring and as we turned him over and raised his head and shoulders to wild sam's knee i tore up our handkerchiefs and tried but vainly to staunch the flowing stream of life never shall i forget the hopeless and despairing look the poor lad turned on me or the terrible gasping whisper oh god have mercy on me i am dying and i so young keep up your heart rollo i said as cheerfully as i could while my heart was sore harry's gone for the doctor and he'll set you all right see the blood is almost stopped take a sip out of sam's flask now and you'll be better he drank the brandy and seemed for a few moments revived while still the blood oozed silently from the ghastly wound how did it happen rollo i asked when i saw him better able to reply i don't know i was looking up for a possum and had the butt of the gun on the ground it must have caught in something for it seemed to give a jerk in my hand it must have caught in the bushes it was near the log there wild sam observed as he knelt with his arm under rollo's shoulders and the youth's head pressed against his treacherous breast where was hidden the gutter flag he had stolen from bereaved dorothy clavers it wasn't near the log i interrupted i was looking at you both the instant before the gun went off you were standing within a couple of feet of rollo's gun sam even in the moonlight i noticed the deadly pallor of the man's cruel-looking countenance and a strange suspicion shot into my mind he was momentarily as white as the dying lad but as i compared the two faces i saw that the fair boy's eyes were looking their last on earth i am dying sinclair he whispered bury me where we we stood to-night i hope for a home there let me find one the last and then with a murmur of dorothy dorothy my grave which was choked by that awful rattle of death the fair head slipped from the treacherous breast and dorothy's young lover was dead it was a sad procession that went down the peaceful hillside we had mounted in such spirits and so full of fresh young life having improvised a hurried stretcher of branches we laid poor rollo on it and softly and silently carried him down to the police camp 
we laid him decently in the forage store to await the necessary inquest and covered the sad white young face up with a blanket then i locked the door and ran up to claver's store i knew what a shock this sad event would be to poor dorothy and how quickly bad news flies still as we had met harry and the doctor on their way to the hill and i had warned them all to silence i hoped to be in time and i was it so happened that there was not a customer in claver's and claver's himself was the sole occupant of his place of business and he stood in the doorway smoking he was a sensible north of ireland man and quiet in his speech and ways claver's i began at once go in at once and give strict orders that your daughter does not come into the store this night or speak to any one except yourself or her mother the man took his pipe out of his mouth and stared at me in utter astonishment it is entirely for her own good i tell you to do this claver's so go and do it as every moment is of importance you can make an excuse by saying that i have warned you of a lot of drunken men knocking about when you come back i will tell you the truth without another word he turned inside but in a few moments returned now what does this mean sinclair he asked as he placed himself behind the counter young rollo burke is dead i replied his own gun went off and shot him it is to prevent dorothy from hearing this suddenly that i wanted you to keep her inside young burke dead why he was in the store not over an hour ago but dorothy what has that to do with dorothy i am aware that it has been hidden from you and the mother but it is pretty well known that rollo and dorothy were deeply attached to each other i believe the poor fellow was only waiting to strike gold before venturing to ask you for your pretty girl and her name was almost the last word his dying lips uttered i never dreamed of this clavis said after a pause her mother has noticed a great change in the child lately but i never dreamed it was that poor child it will fall very hard on her hide it as long as you can send her away till after the funeral if you can her mother shall take her to ballarat early to-morrow clavis said and i bade him good-night as i hastened back to camp as i passed the short distance i observed in the clear moonlight the figures of many men hurriedly making their way towards and down the lead and of course stepped as in duty bound to see what was the cause of the unusual commotion as i turned down the lead in the direction they were all going and which was not far from the police camp i noticed that the gutter flag had disappeared from the germans claim as it was called and i guessed the rest some other shaft in the workings had found the gutter farther on whose claim was it the question was soon answered by a cheer from a hundred voices from dave drew's claim i soon reached it and the first object i let my eyes rest upon was handsome dave himself standing on the summit of the thrown-up stuff and in the act of planting the significant gutter flag staff in the stuff near the windlass and at a little distance from him was the mate who worked with him an honest decent irishman named black holding out for the inspection of the excited diggers his hat in which were several fine nuggets with the soil still clinging to their dingy crevices right on the gutter by jove cried one a regular jeweller's shop dave drew shouted another i congratulate you and myself too for we're next on the line drew smiled pleasantly and his bronzed face looked handsome as a picture yet i fancied a shade of sadness in it as still holding the flagstaff his eyes turned momentarily toward claver's store thank you tom he replied and thank you all mates i hope sincerely you may all be as lucky aren't you going to shout drew cried out a distant voice in the crowd it will be better to leave the shouting until all our mates are here dave said but you may be sure we won't forget to christen the last shaft down on the gutter there's only black and i here now wild sam is at allen's as drunk as a pig one man volunteered i never saw a man drink as he did to-night he poured the liquor down his throat as if it was water and was lying on the floor before you had time to cross yourself young burke's gone up the hill possuming another said they passed my place a couple of hours ago as the men gradually dispersed i climbed up to dave drew's side and he recognised me with one of his pleasant smiles. "'Have you come to see the gutter flag shifted too, Sinclair? It's rather tattered,' he added, as he looked at the big faded G, writhing like a snake in the flickering night breeze. "'But I dare say Rollo will have the new one Dorothy is making up before morning.' "'I congratulate you sincerely, Drew,' 
I began, but we must all take the bad with the good. I bring you bad news, Dave. Bad news? Heaven and earth, there's nothing the matter with old Daddy. No, no. Or, or the girl. And his face grew white and his lips trembled. No, my dear fellow, it is poor Rollo. He is lying dead at the camp. Dead? Rollo dead? The young man seemed to stagger as he caught at the windlass for support. The great generous heart was sore for the sorrow of the girl he had loved so dearly. He listened while I related the sad events of the night on the green hill, and then, after leaving Black to watch the claim, he went down with me to see the body of his dead mate. Once at the camp, I lit the stable lantern and unlocked the door of the forage store. How deeply affected, generous and affectionate Dave was, could easily be seen in his noble-looking countenance as he stooped and lifted the rug from the dead lad's white face, so calm and still and immovable, yet with an expression of despairing sorrow around the pale, delicately curved lips. And so piteous was the sight of the young form lifeless, just when life was offering him her treasures of love and gold, that I did not wonder when poor Dave sat down on the truss of hay and, burying his face in his hands, burst into a passion of tears, which he in vain tried to check. "'I loved him, and she loved him,' he sobbed. "'I would have fought for him, living, and man though I am, I must weep for him dead. Oh, my boy, Rollo, God has been cruel in this!' I went out softly, and left him alone with his grief and the dead, and only returned when I had attended to my horse. Dave was by that time quite calm, but he sat close to the white young face, and one hand rested on the fair glossy waves of the dead lad's hair. "'I cannot leave him, Sinclair,' he said. "'It would seem heartless to leave him here in the dark alone. I will stay with him till daybreaks, at all events.' And so I stayed with him, and with the light of the lantern set on a corn-bin, flickering on the still cold face, and occasional breezes through the open crevices of the wooden store, lifting the soft waves of hair that lay on the white brow. I told Dave more particularly of the events of the evening, and how I had arranged for Dorothy to be taken away on the morrow. "'For he's sure to be buried after the magisterial inquiry,' I said, and the poor girl could see the funeral going up the hill. It would kill her. "'I think it would, Sinclair. It was kind and thoughtful of you. May God bless you for it he added fervently, and then we passed hours in a silence almost unbroken by a word. I confess that leaning against the hay I slept often, but Drew never closed an eye. With elbows on knees and his eyes bent on the ground, or wandering to his dead mate's face, he humoured his own sad thoughts. Were they most with the dead boy or with the living girl? Was poor, old, waiting and faithful daddy forgotten? Not quite, but remembering his good old friend's anxiety and disappointment, it seemed as nothing in comparison with the grief death had laid close to the young heart of Dorothy Clavers. Still, when day broke and the east began to flush, Dave softly kissed the white forehead and reverently covered up the solemn face ere he went quickly to console the old man by the sight of his truant face. Old Daddy had pottered about, getting supper and smoking, and talking to his little dog, Trip, about the hole he hoped to bottom on Monday, and which he dreaded might be discovered before then. For Daddy had been prospecting so cautiously that each morning he started from his tent in an almost opposite direction, and only gained the claim he was sinking on after a long detour, which he, of course, made for the purpose of throwing any curious watchers off the scent. From where he sat and smoked in the moonlight, he could see almost the very spot, which was, indeed, not far from where Rollo Burke's young life was even then flowing out among the shrinking blades of the horrified grass on the green hill, and talked of his hopes and fears to Trip, who sat on his haunches before the old man, listening eagerly, with one ear erect, and with his honest eyes fixed on his old master's face. "'I don't think any one will notice our hole, Trip, for them branches I put over it look quite natural.' and they can't fall in on a can of the logs. But for all that, I wish it was Monday, Trip. And Trip said, Woof! with such energy that he shook himself off his haunches and onto his four feet. Aye, I know you wish the same, little boy. There's fine hunting in the old logs up on the hill, eh, Trip? And Trip said, Woof! Woof! double this time, 
and began to run around after his own shaggy tail until he tumbled over like a drunken man. I wish you wouldn't do that, Trip. It's not good for you. I knew a dog once who used to start running after his own tail every time the stampers of his master's crushing machine set to work, and one day, when he got dizzy, as you are now, he started down the lead like a mad dog and was never seen again until we found him dead near a shaft. Guess it was a fit. That was poor Lamont's dog, the old man soliloquised to himself, and not to trip this time. I wonder what has become of poor Lamont. And old Daddy puffed his pipe silently, and became absorbed in memories of the past so long that on looking up to the now high moon he saw it must be long past midnight, and that all the shafts were silent. "'Dave's got in tow with some friends,' he said, "'and I'm glad of it. I'd like to see the lad quite over his disappointment about pretty Dorothy. Come, Trip, we'll turn in. Dave'll tell us all about it when he comes home.' The old man slept soundly. He did not wake until the bright risen sun was shining straight in the low tent opening. It took him but little time to don his eccentric attire, and when he emerged into the open air he was surprised to see Dave sitting on the log against which the fire was burning, with the breakfast billy hung over it. "'Why, Dave, my lad, you are back then. When I saw your bunk had not been slept in, I thought you had not yet returned. You did keep it up last night.' and then quickly observing the depressed attitude of his favourite and the grievously sad expression of the handsome face, a swift train of thought carried the old miner's eyes down towards their shaft, and he saw the gutter flag floating proudly over it. "'You've bottomed on the gutter, Dave. Hurrah! Why didn't you waken me up and tell me?' Drew lifted his eyes and looked down towards the claim. Yes, they had bottomed on the gutter, and he had almost forgotten it. What did dead Rollo care for gold? Of what use was it to him? It would neither buy a young girl's heart or soften the pain of the blow which had fallen upon it in the loss of her young love. "'What is the matter, my son?' old Daddy asked anxiously, as he fully recognised the change in his young mate. "'What can be the matter while young gutter flag is flying? You haven't hurt yourself in the shaft, Dave, lad?' "'No, Daddy, no. But something very, very sad has happened, and I feel as if I couldn't get over it. You won't have to speak to poor Rollo Burke, Daddy. He is lying dead at the police camp. Dead? Young Burke dead? Yes, Daddy. I sat by his corpse all night. He shot himself accidentally when possuming on the hill last night, and Dave went on relating the incidents of the night to the grieved old digger. They talked long over their breakfast of chops and coffee and good camp oven bread, at the making of which the old man was an adept, and Dave felt better when he had shared his trouble with his friend. There was something soothing in the Sunday morning's quiet too, and in the fresh morning air of the hillside. As, here and there, among the thickly clustered tents, near the lead, threads of blue smoke arose and swelled into columns as the big out-of-doors fires caught fresh fuel and boiled many billies, diggers' forms began to move about in beltless trousers and open-breasted shirts and tumbled hair, just as they had turned out of their bunks. But there was not a sound of human vicinity came up to the mates on the hillside, until all at once a low, regular tap-tap-tap, tap-tap-tap, with short intervals, also as regular as the peck of the woodpecker, floated on the quiet air to the sharp ears of old Daddy. Dave heard it too, and with a sudden movement drew the pipe from his lips and laid it on the grass beside him. A look of fresh pain came into his face also, but he said nothing, until, when the old man had listened for some moments, he asked, "'What can that hammering be, lad? Surely Cross would not work at the new store to-day?' "'It is Cross, Daddy. He's covering poor Rollo's coffin. I sent Black to order it last night, and I called there before I came up home. Cross has been working at it most of the night.' "'Ah, oh, poor lad! Poor lad!' But surely God knows best, Dave. Perhaps he has taken him away from many troubles and much sin. He knows it all best. But see, there is Mrs. Clavers and the girl making a start for Ballarat. Little she thinks that she is listening to the hammer on her sweetheart's coffin, or that his dead body is lying in one of the sheds she passes. Ay, little indeed. Poor Dorothy, poor Dorothy though she wondered much at her mother's sudden decision about inspecting some goods at the wholesale house they dealt with in Ballarat, was not at all averse to the trip. 
few pretty girls are averse to putting on their most becoming garments and going on a shopping expedition but when the spring cart turned into the street with mrs claver's driving and dorothy got a look always her first toward young burke's claim her pretty innocent face flushed up rosy red as she gasped in strong excitement oh mother darling do see the gutter flag the old one is flying on rollo's claim oh how glad i am they have bottomed on the gutter mrs claver's grew pale to her lips put it off as long as she liked how could the sad truth be broken to this bereaved child that was the question the poor mother was propounding to herself while dorothy rattled on i'm so sorry i didn't finish the new flag yesterday evening it was so foolish of me i didn't tell you mother but something wild sam said to me about it made me fold it and put it up on the store shelf i must finish it when we come back tonight, for that old raggy thing is not fit to be seen why cross the carpenter is working on sunday oh i guess dave said he would get cross to make a new flag stuff for my flag that's it and the flag not ready after all mother i'd rather go back and finish the flag for rollo will be disappointed we must all be prepared for disappointment in this world dorothy my dear the mother said in a choking voice for she knew that as our girl was speaking the beloved name they were passing our police camp under one of the humblest roofs of which lay the dead young rollo who would feel disappointment no more we must expect it my child this is a world of woe and of death no dorothy i cannot let you stop at home to-day are you not well mother you are speaking strangely dorothy asked anxiously as she looked into mrs claver's face i am low-spirited dear i am thinking of the troubles of life and how my dorothy will meet them i began mine early when i was about your age i was going to be married to a cousin i dearly loved and he died since then i have lost father and mother and four fine sons all by that pitiless death dear if if i loved any one and he should die i should die too dorothy said stoutly and quite ignoring the father and mother and four fine boys her mother had wept no child surely no you would try to live for your father's sake and mine and dorothy kissed her mother and no more applied the possibility of death to her own case than if her mother had never uttered the word two magistrates from ballarat reached our police camp early in the forenoon of that notable sunday and an inquiry was held over the corpse of poor young burke which resulted in his death being described as resulting from an accidental discharge of his own gun it was observed that the red silk fringed sash which the lad in common with many dandy diggers usually wore drooped its fringe so low that it might possibly have become entangled with the trigger of the gun which was a hair one and though i might have had other suspicions how could i hint at them with no proofs to offer of what i only suspected wild sam was not at the inquiry he had been carried from allen's in the morning so helplessly drunk that we found it impossible to arouse him and my evidence was considered sufficient we buried poor rollo burke when the afternoon sun shone full on his newly made grave on the spot he had chosen on the green hillside he had a noble funeral though the hundreds who followed the velvet covered coffin were clad in all the colours of the rainbow and the sunday dress of many nationed diggers very few men indeed stayed away in tent or place of business for the lad was a general favourite and those compelled to stop at home stood at their doors and watched the sad procession winding away up the hill with the quiet young tenant of the black coffin in the van we carried him shoulder high four at a time changing often as the ascent was difficult so sadly weighted clavers was one of those who lowered the fair head into the grave and old daddy read the grand old burial service over him ere we laid his last blanket of green sods over the lad there were many dim eyes on the green hill that sunday and when we came away and left poor lost rollo alone in his premature grave even sinclair the policeman felt a choking sensation in his throat and a mist in his eyes that hid the lonely grave from them as he turned to have one more look at it before the sinking sunbeams left it to the chill and darkness of the night it was just on the edge of dusk that the claver's spring cart rattled towards the store the reason of dorothy's removal had spread from mouth to mouth over the diggings and hundreds of eyes watched with curiosity or interest or pity the poor girl's return home mrs claver's face was white and rigid 
she dreaded that dorothy might learn the truth from some unguarded customer as they drove through the street and made the tired horse go at his most capable pace but she reached home in safety and her father lifted dorothy from the vehicle with unusual kindness dorothy's first look was at the gutter flag still fluttering helplessly on rollo's claim and she cast an appealing look into her mother's eyes i may finish the flag to-night mother may i not that does look so ragged on sunday night dorothy i am sure you would not like to bring ill luck to the claim and the girl said no more but followed her mother into the yard and kitchen behind poor dorothy felt a strange depression of spirits that night and one which alarmed her she had unconsciously imbibed much of the weird superstition of her parents native country and as she sat on her little white bed preparing for rest she tried poor girl to find a cause for the unusual weight that seemed resting at her heart i don't know what ails me she thought rollo's bottomed on the gutter and mother bought me that lovely black silk to-day yet i feel as if some terrible calamity was over me i suppose i am tired and i wish i could have seen rollo to-night i think i was a little angry and cross because mother wouldn't let me finish the flag and that was wrong of me i'll say my prayers and go to bed she was kneeling beside her bed with her fair hair hanging over her shoulders and the innocent face buried in her hands when there came at the little window a low continued tapping dorothy started and looked up and she saw the finger of a man's hand creating the taps on the one pane of glass which alone formed the window dorothy's face flushed a rosy red as she got up hastily of course it was rollo poor fellow he was as much disappointed as she was the knocking ceased instantly and the hand disappeared as the girl opened the hinged frame a little way before however she had time to speak a horrid whisper that made her start back in a fright crept in through the aperture and the words held her rigid as in the grasp of catalepsy dorothy don't be frightened it is only me wild sam don't shut the window i have something awful to tell you about burke something awful about rollo did did rollo send you she whispered with trembling lips as she leaned against the wooden wall and put her ear near the open pane rollo is dead he was buried on the green hill to-day i can see his grave from where i stand they are hiding it from you dorothy that's what you were taken to ballarat to-day for burke's gun went off accidentally last night when we were possuming and he died in my arms he sent you a message by me tell dorothy that my last word was her name and that i will love her in my grave death cannot kill such love as mine ask her to sit near me for one hour the first night i lie in my grave and it will comfort me to know she is there that is what he said dorothy and i know you will fulfil the poor loving lad's last wish i must go now for i might be seen and he stole away chuckling to himself an awful picture of drunkenness and sin with his red eyes and trembling hands and the fire of perdition in his evil heart she's sure to go he said i shall be revenged yet dorothy stood against the wall in a sort of waking trance for a moment after he was gone it seemed to her as if the world was some far-away place in which she had once been but which knew her now no more was she alive where was she her fair head was lying back against the wall and the breeze from the slightly open window passed across her white face the face slid down to meet the refreshing wind with wonder and then through the narrow open aperture dorothy saw on the moon-flooded green hill beyond the lead a lonely mound which had only been raised that day it was rollo's grave her darling dead rollo's grave not another moment she dreamed or doubted every word of wild sam seemed to flash before her in letters of fire rollo was dead and they had hidden it from her the girl shook herself from the support against which she leaned with a fierce hatred against the mother who bore and the father who begat her she had been a good and dutiful child and they had killed and buried her heart's love without letting her look once in his dead face was she a child that such a death blow had fallen upon her without a moment's warning that a hated man should bring her rollo's last words that she should have heard from his own lips as his head lay upon her bosom tell dorothy that i will love her in my grave death cannot kill such a love as mine ask her to sit near me she'll comfort me the liar's words rang in her ears and heart with the force and truth of gospel words as she fully attired herself with trembling hands 
my rollo dead my rollo dead was the great outcry of the poor child's broken heart she was not afraid as she opened the door she had no thought of father then or of mother there was a grave on a moon flooded hill where rollo awaited her and there was nothing in the empty world save her young lover lying in the cold ground awaiting her to comfort him my own work on that awful sunday had been fatiguing and it was late when i went to bed but before sunrise i was aroused by a sharp nervous knocking at the window of the barrack room in which i slept accustomed to this sort of disturbance i was on my feet and at the door before many minutes had passed to see old daddy lawson standing before it with such a white face and trembling knees that it was evident the poor old fellow had received some heavy shock why daddy what has happened you do look bad come in and sit down i'm scarcely able to stand for sure he said as he dropped into a seat while i pulled out my private bottle and made him drink a jorum from it happened indeed oh sinclair get on your clothes quick and come with me there is no time to lose and as i was dressing he told me the tale i was so anxious about my hole that was nearly bottomed on saturday that i was up on the hill at grey dawn of course i looked toward poor burke's grave as i slanted the rise and something i saw there made me pause in wonder trip too ran toward it barking loudly and i stole nearer for something told me that only one woman would be lying there on the lad's grave a woman yes and laid out at full length on the grass dead sinclair oh don't ask me to tell you more come and see for yourself we went up in the early morning with the cool air fanning our faces and rustling the branches of the trees on the green hill the fresh grass glittered with a fine dew that gleamed palely like hoar-frost and a something white fluttered slightly on rollo's grave as the breeze lifted it gently and with a lifelike movement at length we stood by the mound and before a scene which for awfulness and horror i have never during my police career which you know has been no short one seen equalled on the grave at as daddy had stated full length was stretched the body of dorothy clavers with her own gutter flag spread over her dead face her clothing was disordered and torn her fair head and face clotted and stained with blood marks her little hands were clenched and told of an agony that was but repeated in the awful terror and despair of the poor white pretty face and her unconscious parents were sleeping calmly in the belief that she dreamed happily in her own little bed under the shelter of their loving protection as we looked in silent horror at this awful thing a shout of wild laughter wakened all the echoes on the hill while daddy's little dog ran up toward a cluster of bushes a little higher up i looked in the same direction and perceived something like a crouching wild beast squatted under the shelter of the boughs of course i made my way up instantly with daddy close after me to recognize in the crouching animal wild sam he had no hat on his sleeves were torn his hair and beard tangled with grass and filth his awful face was as of a dead man his eyes red and wilder than those of a springing leopard his coarse knotted hands were blood-stained and held grips of grass he had torn from under the bushes near him and a half dozen brandy bottles broken and whole lay beside him he did not seem to see or know us but laughed that awful laugh until a fit of trembling horror seized him and he shrieked for mercy the wretched being was evidently in the wild paroxysm of delirium tremens ha 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 he shrieked that's what i call ability eh miss dorothy stand off who says wild sam can't get revenge a touch of my toe on the trigger settles your darling rollo eh and yourself my pretty lady didn't i tell you the gutter flag would make a nice face cloth i must get nearer and have another look at you he tried to get on his feet but couldn't and then with hands repelling some miserable horror he shrieked aloud in such evident terror that big drops of cold dew stood on his face as he alternately fought with hands and feet or shrieked for mercy oh go away i promise i promise i won't touch drew i'll give up that oh fire fire my head my head until in utter exhaustion he fell back and i handcuffed him why continue this sad tale the broken-hearted father and mother took their dishonoured dead away from the place and were never seen on the green hills more the murderer escaped to the grave through the drunkard's terrible gate of delirium 
and I myself was removed from the Green Hills Police Station not long after. Dave Drew's claim turned out a rich one, and old Daddy gathered several lumps of the precious metal from his hatter's claim on the hill. I am told that Rollo's grave is there, to be remarked at this day, and that a broken fence still shelters a rose bush, which I planted, a slip, with my own hands. On the Goulburn stretches a broad and rich station, called Tartu, and owned by Messrs. Drew and Lawson, a tall handsome gentleman with a serious grave face and a winning voice and smile enjoys an active life at tartu and often drives carefully or supports the feeble steps of a now very old man whom he affectionately calls daddy they sometimes pause at a nook in the garden where an old dog called trip was buried many years ago and one of them at least often thinks at such times of a grave on the far away green hills i wish you would marry dave lad the old man sometimes says, I should like to see children of yours before I go. And Dave always replies, I shall never marry dear old Daddy, so there is no mistress at Fair Tartu. End of story. Section 10 of Stories from the Detectives Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. The Rosary of the Dead Few would have credited on seeing the weather-stained scattered buildings of slabs and bark that lay under the spur of Barra Range that they were the principal homestead of that splendid property known as Cahir Convelt Station, even to the passer-by on the main road from Berrimer Township to Prasby, they looked so old and neglected as to be apparently almost uninhabitable, but, on closer inspection, a visitor would find sufficient rough bush comfort amid a good deal of decay and not a little dirt. One afternoon in November, a man was riding up toward the homestead on the ill-defined track that led from the main road. He was a tall, fair man of about thirty, with a serious, thoughtful face and a quiet manner. Just now he appeared uneasy and anxious, not to say somewhat annoyed, and it was with more alacrity than was usual with him that he dismounted in the yard, around which were grouped rough tenements of various uses, from the stable to the outbuildings where two of the boundary riders slept. Without waiting to knock, the visitor to Cahir Convelt entered the low, open doorway and found himself in the presence of a stout, bustling woman of about fifty-five, with a quantity of iron-grey hair and a deep-set, keen grey eye. She was coarsely dressed in dark wincey, and had her skirts tucked up and her arms bare, and she was kneading a quantity of dark-coloured dough on the discoloured kitchen table. "'Hello, Tom,' she cried. "'What wind drove you here the day? I thought you were off to praise be. "'So I was, mother, but something I heard on the road turned me.' the man said as he laid his hat on a rough bench and seated himself beside it. "'Something you heard?' And as the woman repeated the words, she looked sharply in her son's face. "'Fay, it must be something queer that would turn you back when you know the bad luck that's in it.' "'There was bad enough luck in what I heard,' he replied. "'Mother, it won't do for you to have Turnbull here the way he is any longer. The whole country is talking about it and laughing at you. He's boss of the whole station and makes no secret of it. Mother, mind what you're about mind what i'm about and well able am i to mind it without your help tom farrell she cried angrily as she turned her red face toward her son and with a fierce movement stripped the clinging dough from her hands and arms do you think i'm not old enough to take care of myself without shepherding who owns kerkomvelt sir is it me or the gossiping paupers that open their dirty mouths into me own son's ears if he was a man he'd shut their throats with their own broken teeth I wish I could, mother, but no man can deny the truth. It's plain to see that Turnbull is trying to soap you over and wants to be made master of Cahir Convelt. Sure you never could believe that a young man like that would have any real liking for you, mother. It's only the money. God forbid that you'd marry anyone that would count every day you lived after too long till he got what he sold himself for. Sold himself? The woman was almost speechless with rage. One would think I was a cripple or bedridden. Tom Farrell. Thank God I'm a stout, able woman, and to the fore as far as me own business is concerned. I made a good wife to your father, young man, and for why, if it suits me, shouldn't I make myself comfortable with what he left me? 
Aye, and if a man likes me, why shouldn't he have what I'd give him? It's jealous you are, Tom Farrell, and frightened you would be done out of your share when I die. But I might live happy after if you're under the sod yourself. As you take it that way, I'll say but a few words more, mother, Farrell said as he rose to his feet. You are mistaken about Cahair Convolt. It is not yours, but mine. You wouldn't have heard this now, mother, only for what you said. Two days before my father died, he gave me a codicil to his will, leaving me every acre of the property after your death, or after your second marriage. He didn't trust you, mother, and though I'm well contented with my own place, if you put Turnbull in my father's place, neither you nor he will find one week's home at Cahir Convelt. The woman was stunned for a moment. The red face grew streaky, the placid cheek sunken, her eyes glared at her son as if at some terrible spectre, and then she uttered a cry of horror and fell on her knees at his feet. "'Oh, Tom! Oh, Tom! For the love of God, don't say it!' she whispered hoarsely. "'If he knows it, he'll kill me. Promise you won't tell Tom. I'm your mother, your own mother!' "'Get up, mother, for mercy's sake!' And he raised her to her feet. "'You know very well I wouldn't take a pound, nor a pound's worth, from you, unless you let yourself be fooled with that schema. Cahir Convelt will be yours while you live.' Only send that man to the right about, and at once. I can't, she sobbed. I can't. It's too late, Tom. How did I know? Why didn't you tell me before? And now it's too late. Too late? Yes, too late. We were married at Presby last month. Oh, what'll I do? He'll be the death of me when he knows the truth. Married? A spasm of mental pain exhibited itself on the manly, serious face of Thomas Farrell. This accounted for the self-assertion of his mother's employé, of which he had heard so much, and which everyone so much resented. Married. So, after all, he had done wrong in hiding his dead father's distrust of his silly widow. Oh, mother, what have you done? But it is too late now. Be the death of you. Surely you are not afraid of this man you have let fool you. I don't know, Tom, cried the sobbing woman, as she mopped her red face with the corner of her apron. I can't help seeing he's turned again me lately, and isn't so particular what he says to vex me. God forgive me if I wrong him, but ever since he got me to make the will, he's short and crooked with me. Make a will? echoed Farrell. Yes, he never let me alone till I did it, Tom. And he has that will? He has. Of course, you left himself everything in it. No, not entirely. He made me leave you the small section marching with your own, Tom Ashore. But after all, what harm was it? Sure he'd be no better off while I'm alive. It's a hard thing for a man to say to his mother, but I must say it to you this day. You're a foolish woman, though you are my mother, Tom Farrell said, as he turned toward the door. There's many would say to you, as you made your bed, so lie in it. But Tom Farrell's not the man to do that. Paul Turnbull will know the truth before that sun sets, and he'll never sleep another night under this roof. Oh, Tom! Will you ruin me entirely? For the love of God, let me tell him myself, if it must be told. I'll tell you he'll kill me if he thinks I deceived him a purpose. Kill you? And how long do you think he meant to let you live after you made that will that suited him? I tell you, mother, that Turnbull has the shadow of bad deeds in his face. If you are afraid of him, more reason for him to go, and you can come over home with me till he's gone. At all events, he'll know the truth from me this day. The woman trembled like a leaf at the fearfully suggestive words of her son, and rocked herself to and fro in an agony of wretchedness and terror. All at once some glimmering of reason began to penetrate through the coat of self-conceit, which is, in many women, almost impenetrable. Even with her fifty and five years, Mrs. Turnbull, as she may now be called, had an imperishable opinion of her own personal charms and notable housekeeping abilities and it was only in connecting her own acknowledgments of her new husband's failing flattery with the hints of his probable bad deeds from her son's lips that she began to realise the possibility of her own danger. Once realised, however, and it rushed to the surface all the cowardly feelings of her weak nature, and she shuddered as though she felt a knife at her throat. "'In the name of Mary, don't lave me, Tom,' she pleaded. "'Let me go right back to your place before you tell him at all.' "'Sure I won't be long gathering a few bits of things together.' Before Tom Farrell had time to reply, a man dashed up to the door on a nearly blown horse and dismounted. 
and there was something in his face as he crossed the threshold that caught Farrell's penetrating gaze and held it. Clark looked from the face of his mistress to that of her son, and then his eyes fell to the ground, and from one to the other of his shifting feet. "'Is anything wrong?' Tom Farrell asked sharply. "'Yes,' and the speaker looked uneasily at Mrs. Turnbull from under his low, dark brows. "'I'm sorry to say that Turnbull has met with a bad fall from his horse. I thought to warn the missus sooner, but I had to ride to Kells after the doctor, and they're bringing poor Turnbull up now. There they are at the gates.' "'Is he much hurt?' Farrell asked, as he looked toward the spring cart that could now be seen slowly approaching the homestead, with two or three men escorting it. "'He seems to be badly hurt, but the doctor hasn't seen him yet. Here's Dr. Margrove riding up now.' Mrs. Turnbull stood like a woman turned to stone. Was she sorry that the man they had been speaking of was badly hurt, or did she draw a breath of relief in recognising the hope that, for a time at least, he should be unable to injure her, no matter what unwelcome news should be imparted to him? No one watching her at that moment could have replied to the question. She turned white and red alternately, and hastened outside to meet the slow procession as it stopped in front of the door, and her son Tom followed her. They let down the tall board, and the man, Clark, who had in some way prepared his mistress of Cahirconvolt for the accident, began, with the assistance of others, to draw the injured man from the bottom of the cart where he lay. He was a tall, dark-complexioned man, of two or three and thirty, but with such a heavy beard and moustache that under his black hair little was visible, save a pair of awfully keen grey eyes that wandered from one to the other of those who surrounded him with a quick suspicion-hinting look. To the hasty inquiries of his as yet unacknowledged wife, he replied shortly, "'I feel no pain, none whatever,' and it was only on recognising Tom Farrell that a hot flush darkened what could be seen of his face. Between Farrell and the fancied heir of Cahirconvolt, there was, and had always been, a bitter, though unexpressed, antagonism. He was carried inside and laid on a couch in the principal room of the homestead, still declaring he felt no pain, and when the doctor, who immediately arrived, examined him, he found no bruises or apparent contusions, only an utter limp helplessness of the lower limbs that puzzled and made him look serious. "'How did it happen?' he asked, as his fingers rested on Turnbull's wrist. "'My horse shied at a stump in the big paddock where Clark and I were running in cattle, and I was thrown. "'On your head? No, I think something fell on my back, but I was stunned or something.' At all events, Clark says it was my back. Yes, volunteered Clark, who stood by. I heard the fall and turned. He was lying on his back, but couldn't keep his feet when I lifted him. His legs seemed dead-like. And you've no pain? None, not a bit. Well, that's good so far, and no bones are broken. You can move your arms and hands. Oh, yes. Without pain? Yes, I have no pain, I tell you. The doctor, after a few more questions, left the room to give some instructions to Mrs. Turnbull, or, as she was yet called, Mrs. Farrell. Tom followed him, and put, on his own part, a few queries to the medical gentleman. "'What do you think of the man's state, doctor? Is he seriously hurt?' "'I don't at all like the symptoms, Farrell. I'm afraid the lower limbs are paralysed. And what does that mean? It means the spine is injured. The man may never recover the use of his limbs, or he may die.' It depends on the extent of the injury. I shall be able to give you a more decided opinion in a few hours. The woman had stood and listened to Dr. Margrove's dictum, with a scared and awed face, yet, strange to say, an expression of something like relief was admitted in the sigh she gave as he mounted his horse and rode away. Then she looked eagerly into her son's serious face. You won't tell him now, Tom, are sure? she asked softly. Not yet, at all events, mother. I couldn't turn him out as he is, and, at all events, you're safe while he's so helpless. There, he's calling you. You'd better go to him. And he followed his mother again to the side of the invalid. The man, Clark, was still with him, and feigning to be arranging the pillow that was under Turnbull's head. Are you keeping easy, Paul? the woman asked, as she bent over him. Yes. What does the doctor say, Bridget? I want to know exactly what he says behind my back. Mrs. Farrell, as I will continue to call her, looked uneasily at her son, and so evidently hesitated. Then Tom replied plainly, "'There's no use hiding the truth, mother. Dr. Margrove says that he's afraid your limbs are paralysed, Turnbull, that your spine is injured. If that's true, I'll be a cripple for life.' 
Yes, if you lived, returned Tom Farrell with emphasis. Ah, he thinks I may not live, eh? He thinks it possible. You'd better prepare for the worst, Turnbull. I had. Bridget, come here. You'd better tell Tom about our marriage. As I'm to lie here helpless, it's as well everyone should know that I have the right. Farrell's face flushed up in spite of the manly control he held over himself, but he met Turnbull's deep-set eye with a firm, steady gaze. "'I know all about that already,' he replied. "'But we needn't talk of it now. When you are all right, if ever you are, Paul Turnbull, we'll settle all about that business.' "'Aye,' said the prostrate man, with a grin of enjoyment that, under the circumstances, seemed almost diabolical. I was afraid you wouldn't like that news, Tom. But, helpless as I am, and crippled as I am, it's too late now to deny that I'm master of Cahirkenvolt. No, you're not, Paul Turnbull. Not yet. In spite of his reason and determination, Farrell's eyes flashed fire as he made this energetic denial of his foolish mother's husband's claims. But dreading his own feelings, he had no sooner spoken than he hastily passed through the doorway to the kitchen. "'What the devil does he mean?' cried Turnbull, furiously. "'Look out, Mrs. Turnbull. I'll not lie here and be bullied by any man, son or no son.' "'What else can a helpless man do?' asked the man clerk in a low tone. "'To hear you talk, one would think you forgot you were badly paralysed, and that to save your life or strike a blow, you couldn't take one step to that door.' "'Ah, uh, yes, I forgot,' the invalid exclaimed with a groan. "'I forgot. God help me.' What can I be now but a burden, where I thought to be a comfort and a help? You'll never be a burden, Paul, the weak woman said, as she dissolved again in tears, and caressed him. And you mustn't mind, Tom, for you know, darling, it's natural he'd be angry and disappointed, thinking Cahirkinvelt his own, mostly. And so, with what she considered a very venial duplicity, she attempted to soothe the ruffled plumage of the man she had, but one short hour ago, dreaded with a mortal dread. A few days passed without recording any material change in the apparent sufferer. Tom Farrell visited Cahirkinvolt frequently, and, in his silent way, took keen note of all that passed there. He saw that his mother was anxious and nervous and tearful, yet with no anxiety for the recovery of her younger husband. Farrell was a keen judge of human nature, by very instinct, as it were and if he guessed that Mrs. Turnbull only dreaded the invalid's recovery as the loss of the one shield between her and certain misery, if not death itself, he was the last man to wonder at feeling so natural under the circumstances. As for Turnbull himself, he reclined hour after hour of the long days in the deep invalid's chair which had been brought from Prasby for his comfort, and, with his helpless limbs propped up on pillows and cushions, and his head raised easily, he watched every movement of the household with eyes that seemed to have become inheritors, and untiring inheritors, of the lost vigour of his paralysed limbs. Poor Bridget Farrell, as she longed to think herself yet, felt that, moved where she would in the three chambers, the sick man's eyes commanded through the open doors. She was under a watch as intolerable as it was terrible to her. Her face got a drawn look of pallor, her late two rosy cheeks like suddenly shrivelled parchment. Her faded eyes had a hunted look in them, and at times the sound of her husband's voice made her tremble like a leaf. Something of his mother's state Farrell saw and recognised, and he made it his business one day to meet Dr. Margrove on his way to Cahirkenvolt, to see if he could not put a stop to it in some way or other. The doctor was jogging along steadily within a couple of miles of the station, when, from a crossroad, he was joined by Farrell. These two men had a thorough respect for each other, though occupying such different positions, Tom being a married man with a small family, in whom the doctor had been frequently professionally interested. "'Ah, Farrell, on your way to the station too, I suppose?' "'Yes, but I've been watching for you, doctor. I want to speak to you. Nothing wrong at the home, I hope. No, they're all hearty, thank God. I want to speak to you about Cahirkenvolt. What do you think of Turnbull's case, doctor?' "'Well, I don't know what to think of it, Tom.' And that's the truth, though it's not every medical man would own such a truth. Nor, indeed, would I own it except to yourself, for I know who I am speaking to. And so do I, doctor, and that's the very reason I made up my mind to open my mouth to you. I'm uneasy about my mother's state at Cahirkenvelt, and I want your advice about it. 
Ah, she did a very foolish thing in marrying that Turnbull Tom, but it's too late now to mend that matter. At her time of life, to throw away such a property on such a man was the act of a mad woman. She's thrown away nothing but herself, doctor. Cahair Convelt is not hers to throw away. You astonish me, Farrell, as he lifted his serious grey eyes to his companion's face. Ay, I dare say, but Turnbull himself will be even more astonished, for he doesn't know the truth yet. The truth is this. I hold a codicil to my father's will that he got executed the last day we were in Presby together. In that codicil, a second marriage takes away even my mother's life interest in Cahir Convelt, and, in any case, gives it to me or mine at her death. "'Does your mother know this, Tom?' the doctor asked, with apparent interest. "'She does now, but I only told her the very day Turnbull got hurt when she told me that, in spite of all my warnings, she had married him. I declared then that he should not sleep another night under my father's roof, but how could I turn a dying man out? Doctor, I am certain as I stand here that Paul Turnbull is a man black-hearted as sin.' Ever since I saw him blind the poor little Rowan mare, I wouldn't put any deed past him. When was that? One day last summer, I was crossing to Shanks for the loan of a crosscut, and came on him holding the mare by the bridle, and beating her about the head with the butt-end of his loaded whip. I'll never forget it. He burst both the poor little animal's eyeballs, and kept beating her, with the blood and sight running over his hand as he rained down the blows. It was just after that time Shanks' place was stuck up, and I carried a revolver about me, which was a lucky thing for the poor beast, as I put her out of her pain with a bullet through the brain. I told Paul Turnbull my mind at the time, so he knows me, and I know him. "'He has a bad expression of face, most truly,' said Dr. Margrove. "'And now, what I want to know is, if Turnbull is fit to be moved,' continued Farrell, with a determined air, "'my mother is fading visibly since he's hurt, and I'm sure he's holding some sort of terrorism over her.' It's time that he was told the truth, that he hasn't a right to a bit or a breath at Cahirkenvelt. Of course, my mother I will always find home and plenty for, but for him, not a crust. He will neither live nor die at Cahirkenvelt, if I can help it. It is a serious matter, Farrell, returned the medical man, after a thoughtful pause. Let me advise you to leave matters as they are a day or two longer. I am daily expecting a friend up to recruit a man who has made paralysis an especial study. I should like to have his opinion of Turnbull's case. The paralysis is apparently extending. Yesterday one arm was also helpless, yet, strange to say, there is no coldness of the lost limbs, only a sort of numb limpness as far as I can understand. Well, I suppose I must stand it for a couple of days more, Farrell returned with a gloomy air. But it's deuced hard. What is hard, Tom? What is it that is so difficult of endurance? Is it the being obliged to act a lie, as it were, in treating a perhaps dying man as the master of Cahirkenvelt? Or is there something you are hiding from me? There is something I am trying to hide from myself, doctor, a dread that I couldn't put into words if I tried. What did a young man like that marry the poor foolish old woman at all for? And having married her, why did he never let her rest a day or night till she made a will in his favour? There's the question I ask you. "'And it is one scarcely worthy of you, Tom Farrell,' Dr. Margrove answered quickly. "'I would try and get such suspicions out of my head if I was you. "'At all events, the man is helpless now, utterly helpless, "'and unable to injure a dog with his own hand.' "'So well,' Farrell replied sternly. "'Let it drop, Tom, let it drop. "'I tell you, I don't like the turn our conversation has taken. "'Send him from Cahirkenvelt as soon as common charity will admit, if you will. "'But, in the meantime, Try and think less evil of him, knowing how greatly he might be wronged in your thoughts. Are you coming up? Yes. They had reached the turning toward the homestead, and in a few moments alighted at the door. Tom's mother was there to meet them, her face whitely and with dark shadows around her eyes. Her blue lips trembled as she spoke, and the ready tears filled her faded eyes. Well, Mrs. Turnbull, how's our patient today? No better, doctor, no better. He hasn't the use of one finger now. Still, his appetite is good, and he sleeps. Oh, yes, sir, he sleeps. You don't look well yourself, my good woman. We'll be having you knocked up next. You must get someone to help you with this night watch. I suppose you're getting no rest. Oh, yes, doctor. Clark sat up with Paul last night, so I was in bed the whole night. But I couldn't sleep. Sleep seems gone from me somehow. 
I can't help fancying that there's a corpse in the house at night. When I open my eyes and see him lying there like one dead, for an int me, the breath seems to lave me. The poor woman almost whispered all this, and with such an appealing look at Tom that it haunted him years after. Your nerves are upset, Dr. Margrove said, and I'll send you a composing draught. But why don't you close your bedroom door so that you can't see Turnbull? He won't let me. But come inside. He'll be angry. With a resolute and suspicious expression of countenance, Farrell followed his mother and Dr. Margrove to the sitting-room, where the invalid lay on a folding couch. His shoulders and head were so elevated by cushions and pillows that, as he faced the two doorways of egress, he could see every act of importance in the principal apartments of the homestead, as well as watch every movement. He was fully dressed, and the almost unnatural yellow of his face contrasted unpleasantly with the snowy whiteness of his well-got-up shirt-front and the dark weight of his heavy beard. A vicious gleam from his eyes in the direction of his wife was intercepted by Tom Farrell, under whose frowning gaze Turnbull flinched slightly as his eyes fell. "'Well, how do you find yourself to-day?' was the doctor's question, as he made the usual professional movement towards Turnbull's wrist. "'Worse. My other arm's gone. Look here, doctor. I want to know the plain English of this. Am I going to be a cripple here for the remainder of my life? If I am, I may as well make my mind up to it. That's all. I can't answer you that question, Turnbull. At least not just now. I confess, and I have just confessed to Farrell, that your case puzzles me. The symptoms are very odd and unusual. But you must keep up your hopes. I expect to get some of the best advice from an eminent medical man who— I'll have no more advice. I'll have no eminent medical men here. Mind what I tell you, Bridget. If another doctor crosses this door, I'll— What'll you do? What'll you do? asked Tom, interrupting the violent man with something of a sneer, as Turnbull, who had partly raised his head, let it fall back again on the pillows. The man's face and expression had been for the moment that of a man beside himself with rage. The couch on which he lay shook from head to foot, a fact which was not lost upon some of the observers. "'It's true, Tom Farrell, though it's not a man's place to remind me of it under my own roof. I can do nothing, though I might wish this minute for one hour's strength in my right hand. If I had, you wouldn't stand there long and mock me.' "'Hush, hush,' Dr. Margrove urged. One such scene as this must have more permanent ill effect than days of confinement. Come, Farrell, you had better leave the room, as I must insist on quiet for my patient. Let him keep quiet, then, Tom said, as he turned from the room, and a harder job man never had than he finds it this day. With a look of intense scorn at the reclining form with the convulsed face, Farrell shot this bolt and went out. Tom, you're very hard on the crather, Mrs. Turnbull said, as she followed him with the always ready tears rolling over her worn face. You ought to be making allowance for him, Tom. A poor man lying a helpless cripple, maybe for his life. You're a fool for yourself, mother, Farrell said shortly, but when he met the faded and pleading eyes, his own softened. The only excuse I have, mother, is that I think this man is a rogue and a swindler in every way, and I'm determined to watch his doings. And now, see here, mother, out of this house I don't sleep one night until he leaves it. It may be long, or it may be short, but here I'll be to see that nothing happens to you at all events. I've no faith in a bone of Turnbull's body, or a beat of his black heart. So make me up a bed here on the settle, and I'll come over as soon as the sheep are hurdled and the supper over at home. A look of relief came into the woman's face, yet she hesitated and looked fearfully toward the inner room. I'll be glad, God knows, Tom. But he won't like it. I don't care. What can he do? He can order me not to let you inside. And I can order him outside. Oh, Tom, you promised me you wouldn't tell him, yet a while, at all events. Nor will I, unless he drives me to it. But do you think I'd be prevented of my father's roof for the likes of him? No. And heaven send that I've not done wrong in giving you such a promise at all. Here's the doctor coming out. Mind, I'll be back about ten. If you're in bed, don't get up. Just leave the kitchen door on the latch. Bridget, shouted the irritated, suppositious owner of Cahirkenveld, as the sound of the visitor's horse's hoofs were dying in the distance. Bridget, come here, I say. Faith, Paul, I believe you're better. See now how you raised your hand. I didn't, 
The pillow fell from under it. Come here and settle it. What was that beauty of a son of yours saying to you out there by yourselves? Tom Farrell is a good son at all events, the mother returned, bridling into something of her old aggressiveness with the courage imparted in the knowledge that Tom was to protect her every night henceforth. A better never put foot in a boot. What was he saying, is it? Well, he was only telling me that from this out he'll sleep every night at Cahirkinvel. Are you mad, woman? Mad? For what? Is it because my son thinks fit to sleep in the place and look after me? And for why shouldn't he? Because I say he shall not, that's why. You seem to forget, fool, that Tom Farrell is not master here, and never will be. I am boss now, ma'am. There's where you're mistaken, Paul. At last, I'm alive yet, and if I wasn't, well, the Lord is above all. Turnbull had stared at her as she spoke, doubtless wondering at the deceived woman's courage to beard him so, even in defence of her son. But as she alluded to her life interest in Cahirkenvelt, such an evil smile distorted his lips as might have been worn by Satan himself. Just at that moment, however, the man Clark appeared at the door, and Mrs. Turnbull gladly escaped to the kitchen, as she was accustomed to do at the arrival of her husband's favourite. Clark was an undersized, low-browed man, with a deep chest and strong muscles, but he had the slow slouching air of one who had an objection to activity of any sort, and the sharp suspicious eye of a man who saw beneath the surface of things, and was shrewd enough to follow his own interest safely through them. He drew a chair close to Turnbull, and, in a low tone, began to give him an account of some business he had been transacting on his behalf. It was strange, the woman thought, that in the midst of their conversation Clark should break into coarse peals of vulgar laughter, unmindful, for a time, of the oaths of the invalid at his folly. "'I can't help it, Turnbull. For the life of me, I can't help it. Talking of you lying there like a helpless log, and asking me to do this little job for you, is too good. No siree. There's my share, and what I said I'd do to the creek. In the thing itself, I wouldn't have a hand if you gave me six times what I've got your signature for. And he placed a small file in Turnbull's hand. You're a fine mate, Turnbull said bitterly, as he hastily hid the file amongst his pillows. God forbid I'd be your mate, or any man's mate in the like, was the retort. And you may as well make up your mind at once, for I tell you plainly, I'll not be within twenty miles of Cahirkenvelt when it's done. I set a value on my own neck if you don't. Curse it, man, there's no risk in it as I've planned it. I'm glad of it for your sake, Paul, but I'm not partial to such things, even at a distance, so I'm off to praise be for oats. And a loud sarcastic laugh gave point to his words. Well, be it so, cried Turnbull decisively. Farrell won't be here till after ten. At nine, do you be at the spot. Don't fail. No fear, and I'll be on my way to Praiseby the same time. I'll take the cross-road to the cross-panel and sleep at Conway's. I wish you could provide as good an alibi, Paul, he added, with a leer at the helpless man on the couch. But, ha, ha, what am I thinking of, and you paralysed? Good evening, Mrs. Turnbull. What does the doctor say today? Pretty much the same, Clark, replied the unconscious woman, who had just returned to the apartment. In a day or two more he'll know better, and there's a great Melbourne doctor coming up to his place he's going to bring to see Paul. Oh, with the help of God, he'll be all right. Shut your mouth, you old fool, exclaimed the invalid. Didn't I tell you that no more doctors will come near me? Be off out of that and bring here pen and ink. I want you to write a line for me. Clark's going in to praise me. Obediently the simple woman brought the necessary materials, while Clark and her ill-tempered husband exchanged a few more words. Then, as the man left, she seated herself, pen in hand, and awaited instructions. "'Write, dear Tom,' dictated Turnbull, and with great pains and ill success, Mrs. Turnbull scrawled, "'Dear Tom,' across her page of notepaper, thinking all the time of her own good son." but alas little dreaming when and how her tom's eyes would light on the rudely formed letters forgive me for what i've done for i can't stand this life any longer god bless you when i'm gone my lord what's that you're making me write the amanuces almost shrieked as she sat bolt upright and stared at turnbull with terror in her eyes 
it isn't thinking of making away with yourself you are the devil take all fools of women look at the blot you've put on it now hand it here till i see it Pah, that scrawl isn't fit to send any one and he pushed the paper contemptuously down with his hand as he spoke see that now paul the poor creature cried triumphantly i knew you had the strength in that arm yet please the lord you'll be all right again soon but sure i'll write another letter only you frightened me no let him write it himself he can write it as well as that anyway oh it's for clark what a fright you gave me paul ashore and paul ashore ground his teeth as she began to enlarge on the subject of his recovering hand and arm ay it's me i must be off turnbull or i won't reach praisby before the storm breaks hark thunder was beginning to roll and mutter in the distance as the evening approached and mrs turnbull tried to persuade clark of the folly he should be guilty of in going a journey at that late hour with the prospect of a wet night before him but he was determined if it should be raining hard about nine o'clock i'll stop at smith's he said significantly to turnbull as he was leaving the room and turning his sallow face toward the window through which he could see the low gathering black clouds the invalid scanned their threats with a scowling brow and murmured words of which only himself knew the terrible meaning they kept early hours at Cahirkenveldt, and it was barely eight when the poor woman, who had forfeited so much by her silly marriage, paused by the couch to arrange Turnbull's pillows and covering, and generally attend to his wants, ere she retired for the night. "'Faith, I'm sorry you're so bent on laving your clothes on, Paul,' she said. "'For how can you sleep aisy at all that way? But please God, you'll be able to take to your own bed in a couple of days more. Are you sure there's nothing else now?' nothing nothing only go was the irritable answer and for my sake get to bed as quick as you can and keep your tongue quiet don't touch me as she was stooping to kiss him for mercy's sake don't touch me and he unconsciously lifted one vigorous hand to push her off from his side she laughed a low pleasant laugh as she said and indeed paul darlin i'd rather feel the strength of that push than a dozen kisses well good night ashore i'll not forget to say a prayer for you anyway a prayer ay he needed it as he reclined on his couch with his awful face toward the door of his wife's bedroom his heart was beating so quickly that great lumps seemed to rise in his throat and choke him every movement of the woman he watched with straining eyes made him shudder in spite of himself yet a strange fascination held his gaze on every turn of her hand while the sound of her foot softly though she made it fall was louder than the growing thunder in his ear a lamp stood behind him on a small table but it was lowered and a heavy shade drooped over it so as mrs turnbull was dependent on this light alone for assistance in preparing for rest the bedroom was in such deep shadow that the watcher was barely able to detect the movements in which he had such an apparent interest the time seemed to him interminable yet scarcely five minutes had elapsed ere mrs turnbull knelt by her bedside to perform her nightly orisons she was as yet divested of none of her usual attire only the white linen cap under which the grey hair was drawn intimated an intention of rest for over twenty years the poor woman had knelt in that one spot for her faithful prayers and it was there on her knees that her first realization of rest after day's labour had always met her on the threshold of the night as it were and on this night especially her first ave was murmured in a sigh of content but why was it that her mind would wander away from her prayers to the memory of old happy days with those that were gone as through the gathering tears her gaze rested on the familiar cover and pillows why was it that it was the faces of her dead husband and children she saw upon them and not the face of the living paul turnbulls so apparently real were these faces and so vivid her memories of them that it seemed as though she had but to put her hand out to lay it on the faded cheeks of her dead darlings until all at once the real memory of her son tom washed them all out and left himself her beloved and sole idol until his place had been usurped temporarily by the false turnbull whose eyes were now bent upon her with the lurid fire of a satanic influence burning them dry now at last she saw and recognised her own folly and this man's utter and selfish worthlessness and saw her treason to her old loves in its true light while her face fell upon her clasped hands as she wept forgive me my darling boy she cried inwardly and may the living god forgive me too 
and bless you tom darlin of my heart turnbull lay and watched and as he watched the muscles of his limbs grew rigid strange to say those limp and helpless limbs gathered themselves for a spring and he sat erect with his long fingers gripping into the arms of the chair like a vice he saw the dropping tears and the sad gaze at the empty bed and he saw the droop of the bowed head as it was lowered to the hiding hands and at last seemed to drop sideways and helpless as all volition left the woman's form as it slipped to the floor she felt it too for only one moment as the shadow of death seemed to close around her senses and shut her out with a shadowy veil for ever from earth one or two gasps she gave one or two vain struggles to grasp the bedclothes she made with her unreliable hands and then her spirits glided into eternity as her body sank to the floor of her chamber of death the beads which had been clasped in her left hand fell against her breast and became entangled in a hook of the half-open dress its simple silver cross glittering like a distant star in the rays of the shaded lamp behind the paralysed man tom farrell was detained at home that night much later than he had intended by the breaking of such a storm as years before had not witnessed it was fully eleven ere as the parting thunder was dying in the distance he started to reach Cahirkinvolt. there had been such a furious downfall of rain that the creek was flooded and roared along its bed with a wild and dangerous violence that undermined its banks and carried uprooted trees in its surge but tom had not to cross its bed and as the moon broke coldly from the wild dark clouds she lighted his way toward his mother's home once the track led him so close to a bend of the creek that the branches growing low on the banks swept his face like a cold wet hand and as he tightened the bridle to draw his horse away from the disagreeable objects a something seemed to be swept from the foliage and slip with a rattle over the pommel of his saddle to the grass beneath his horse's feet he saw something gleam in the faint moonlight too and paused in wonder as he tried to see the object which had fallen under the shadow of the bushes but vainly and he rode on in uneasy speculation as to what could have been for farrell as an irishman was not devoid of the superstitious fears of his countrymen for the indulgence of which the lateness of the hour and the mooning sounds of dying wind and rushing water were at least a faint excuse knowing the place so well as he did tom had no difficulty in stabling his horse without disturbing any one or in reaching the back entrance which his mother had left open for him on the rough sofa in the kitchen too he found a comfortable couch spread for him and he was able to see it quite distinctly by the light which crept from the room in which turnbull lay through the open door between the two apartments farrell did not however lie down before he had glanced into the parlour and seen turnbull with closed eyes and awfully white face apparently asleep could he have seen the shuddering of those apparently closed lids or heard the fierce thuds of the hard-beating heart beneath them he might not so readily have rejoiced that all was quiet in his poor mother's chamber he did observe that the door between the quiet sleeper's room and the parlour occupied by turnbull was closed and he felt glad that for once the poor mother would get rest from under the baleful watch of the suspected invalid tom did not fall asleep readily the silence of the house seemed oppressive to him the steady tick of the remorseless clock sounded louder and louder as the minutes lengthened he found himself growing nervous and remembered with a strange persistence his mother's remark about her fancying there was a corpse in the house indeed to him it appeared as if the stillness was abnormal and he would have been glad to hear even the squeak of a mouse all at once however as he was trying to reason himself out of such foolishness the stillness was broken by a shout of such awfully intense and desperate terror that as he sprang from the sofa his own blood seemed curdling in his veins farrell farrell are you there come in and break the door oh lord the voice was turnbull's and as tom darted into the room he lay among his pillows panting for breath and with his fearfully distended eyeballs flaming with terror he was gripping the clothes with clammy trembling fingers but tom farrell could not see that as the hands were hidden but he saw the white damp face and the flaring eyes fixed on some object which was not himself in the name of charity what's the matter with you paul turnbull are you mad or worse the voice exerted a powerful influence on him addressed he closed his eyes for a moment with a fierce effort and shuddered from head to foot i've been dreaming i think he said and when i opened my eyes i fancied i saw your mother standing there just where you are 
and she is there he added she's touching you he stopped himself then with a strong attempt at calmness as he spoke again for god's sake tom farrell open the door and see if she is asleep or is there something wrong as he was speaking the strangest feeling came over tom he looked around him and saw nothing yet he was conscious as of the contact of a tangible body a cold hand appeared to rest for a moment on his lovingly and yet with a warning in its pressure and when it was removed he darted to the door of the bedroom and opened it the light from the lamp which turnbull had raised fully illuminated the room and at the first glance he saw it was empty where is my mother he cried turning angrily toward the man on the couch isn't she there i don't know don't i tell you i saw her in this room just now i don't understand it i wish you'd hand me a drink farrell with a look of intense scorn the alarmed son turned from him and seizing the lamp instituted a close search of the homestead it was a vain one though he left no corner unvisited and when he returned to the parlour he found turnbull drawing the blankets from the haggard face they had hidden during his absence and heard as the voice of a dying man the weak pleading words of the cowardly wretch for god's sake don't leave me here again i won't be left send john martin here martin martin and he shouted until one of the now thoroughly aroused household came at the call of him he supposed to be now entire master of cahirkinvelt whatever might have been the suspicions aroused in farrell's mind by this strange conduct he uttered no word of them at that time but passing again into his mother's room he made a careful examination of the undisturbed bed and the few indicating articles of the late presence of the lost woman now for the first time he observed that the window was open and a strong damp breeze flapping the blind to and fro and then he suddenly caught sight of a bit of white paper with written characters upon it lying on the white bed cover and indeed on the very spot where the grey head of the missing woman had rested so short a time before his strong hand trembled as he raised it and his face paled as he recognised his mother's writing and read the words apparently addressed to himself dear tom forgive me for what i have done for i can't stand this life any longer god bless you when i'm gone the words seemed to blur themselves before the poor fellow's eyes as he read the deceiving words and it was in his heart to go out and smite with one revenging blow the black life out of the man whose selfishness and ill words had driven a poor woman to what this awful paper pointed at but he crushed back the temptation determined to bide his time soon every man on the station save the one turnbull's command chained to his side was out searching for the lost mistress of cahirkinvelt until the breaking of another fierce storm rendered further search as impossible as futile no one might envy the wretched hours passed by the distracted son in the deserted home of his mother as he awaited the passing of a wild storm and the tardy break of day he sat by the side of his mother's bed and with his elbows on his knees watched every shade in the dark face of paul turnbull that the latter was undergoing an almost martyrdom under farrell's searching and suspicious watch was evident in the restless eyes that feigned not to observe a look that was driving him almost mad and in his determined attempts to move his head so that his face should be averted outside the wind tore through the bush as though fiends rode upon its pinions and the roar of the creek down which a torrent rushed carrying destruction with it sounded like the voice of many thunders great sheets of wind-blown rain dashed too at intervals against the roof and window and the old house shook and groaned in the blast like a living thing in agonised terror farrell sat through it all with the rigidity of a statue only when grey morning broke quietly after the terrible night he rose and went out silently having aroused all the men available and recommenced a search in which his mother's few lines had left but little hope Farrell himself re-examined every spot of ground between the bedroom window and the nearest point at which the bank of the creek could be gained. It was impossible not to draw the conclusion that, in all probability, the desperate and disappointed woman had crept through the window from the fact of its having been found open, but the heavy rain would have totally obliterated much more evident tracks than the poor woman would have been likely to leave behind her, and not a trace could be discovered. Examining the ground, foot by foot, he at last reached the bushes against which he had almost ridden the previous night, and all at once he remembered the object that had seemed to fall from those branches to his pommel and thence to the ground. 
and he paused to examine the locality. The spot was not far from the homestead, and between the latter and the creek, which here took such a sudden bend that the heavy flood water was sweeping against the opposing point with a strong and undermining force. Many previous floods had undermined this high bank, and in one place a huge and half-uprooted tree hung over the boiling water that swayed its limp and broken branches to and fro with a helpless and melancholy movement. Behind the half-exposed root of this great tree was a huge chasm, worn deeper and deeper by the constant winter drip and drainage of the higher land as it found its way downward to the creek, and in this lonely spot it was that Tom Farrell lifted from the damp grass the object that had fallen across him the night before. It was a well-known one, the rosary upon which he had seen his poor mother tell her prayers from his earliest boyhood. A helpless despair fell over the strong man as he lifted the beads and looked at the merciless surging water. What hope could he have now, save that miles away her broken body might be recovered to share, even so, his father's grave? But even amid the ineffable pity and grief he felt for the lost woman's fate, nay, indeed, perhaps because of it, his feelings of hate and detestation for Paul Turnbull became intensified until his breast boiled with a rage that threatened to consume him. A wild wave of blood reddened his very forehead, and he clutched the rosary with words that ill became the contact of its simple crucifix. It was well that at this moment Dr. Margrove made his appearance, riding toward the station at his usual steady pace. Farrell stepped out and joined him, and astonished the gentleman by an intimation of his mother's suspected fate. "'Yes,' he cried, "'and if it wasn't that the villain who drove her to this is helpless hand and foot, I'd say it was he that murdered her in spite of her own written words. She was the last woman in the world to do the like, Doctor, if she hadn't been driven mad.' Dr. Margrove's face grew more strangely serious than even the sad circumstances seemed to warrant, as he listened to Farrell's words and looked at the sheet of notepaper handed to him. "'And however it goes,' Farrell went on excitedly, "'in my father's house that man does not stop another night. No one but myself knows how hard it is for me to keep my hands off him, and if he hasn't spilt my poor unfortunate mother's blood, it's his deeds that made her spill it herself. Out he goes this day, doctor, if he had to be carried on a stretcher. Are you quite certain that this is your mother's writing, Tom? As certain as one can be of anything they didn't see done. But what do you mean, and why do you look so strange? You have something on your mind that you are afraid to tell me, Dr. Margrove. I have, Tom. I have had some strange suspicions for several days, and I wish to goodness I had imparted them to you as things have turned out. But how could I guess such an awful tragedy as this? I had made up my mind, before coming this morning, to have a thorough understanding with Turnbull today, and now I am more than ever bent upon it. Let us go on up to the house, Farrell. What did the man Turnbull read in the faces of these two men that made his heart almost cease to beat, and the blood to stand cold in his veins? That of Farrell was white as the face of a man in a fierce agony of helpless passion. That of Dr. Margrove, solemn and awful as the face of a judge who dons the black cap to give a death sentence. He was reclining as before, with the coverings of the chair unruffled over his limbs, but those limbs trembled under the covering, and the fact did not escape the doctor's professional eye. Farrell strode to the front, and with a low, concentrated voice demanded, "'Paul Turnbull, what have you done with my mother?' "'Me!' It was a gasp rather than a word, for there was a grip of fear like the grip of death at his heart. "'It is a cowardly act, but one well becoming you, Tom Farrell, to ask a helpless man that. Will nothing but my life satisfy you, because I am your mother's heir? "'You are nothing lawful. You are a murderer in God's sight, and man will see it. Helpless? Where are you helpless?' Turnbull turned a rigid, appealing look to the doctor. Do you hear what this fool is accusing me of, Doctor? At all events, you can deny that. I'm sorry to say I cannot, Turnbull, Dr. Margrove said. I have for days been suspicious that you were malingering, and my only doubt was the fact that you could have no possible end to serve with such a pretense. God forgive me if I wrong you, but my suspicion now of your purpose is a frightful one. They are not suspicions, they are certainties. Look at his coward's face with the murderer's fear on it. Helpless, yes, with the horror of his own deeds. What have you done with my mother, Paul Turnbull? I have no one to protect from me from a bully, and the quack he is bribed, stammered Turnbull. 
I married your mother lawfully, as you know, and the disappointment has driven you mad. It is hard for you to see me, Master of Cahirkenvelt, but I am, and I'll let you know it. Dan, Rasper, Middleton, come in here and turn out these wretches. He had raised himself now, and with a countenance so ash-like as to render all more terrible the wild terror of his bloodshot eyes, was shouting to the men he knew were about the homestead and aware of his position in it. Already the unusual disturbance had drawn several nearer to the sitting-room, and the voice of Turnbull soon brought half a dozen faces crowding around its door and trying to press forward so as to see the cause of the commotion. "'It's well you've come,' said Farrell, "'as what I have to say will be the sooner known. Ye all know that this man married my poor mother for the station of Cahirkenvelt, that never will be his. Well, now he has murdered her, and for what?' Look at the face of the wretch as he hears me say his crime was in vain. My poor father, foreseeing that some villain might take advantage of the poor woman's soft heart, turned the station over to me if she married. And now, see what he has gained by his crime. Villain! Stand on your feet and confess. What have you done with my mother? As the last sentence was uttered, Tom seized the wretch on the couch and dragged him from his support and covering. Turnbull seemed as a child in the bereaved son's hands, and Farrell's muscles were as iron while he shook the trembling wretch to his limp limbs. In vain, he feigned. They would not support him. Tom's grip on his collar was hard and firm. He was not permitted to slide to the floor, as he was evidently trying to do. "'God gave you strength, and you used it to murder an innocent woman,' Farrell shouted. "'Monster! What have you done with my mother?' All at once, as he spoke, the limbs of Paul Turnbull stiffened, and he stood erect on the floor. The expression of his face was so terrible in its awful horror that Tom loosened his grip from his neck, and wonderingly followed with his own eyes those of the horrified man whose arms were raised rigidly as though to ward off the haunting apparition he beheld. His eyes were directed toward the doorway, and there Farrell beheld the form of his mother dimly outlined against the grass and trees of the scene outside. Her face was of the dead, pale and awful, and with a dread solemnity of look that was never worn by living countenance. She was dressed in her usual attire, and her grey hair hung loose from her neck and dripped as though with heavy rain. Tom's lips trembled as he stretched out his hands toward the shadow imploringly, but as he would have spoken, it glided into the open air, gradually disappearing, as it were, toward the creek. Until it had disappeared, Turnbull stood erect, then he fell like a log upon the floor. "'Dan Markham, tie the coward hand and foot,' said Farrell. "'I have sent for the police, and you will soon be relieved of the charge. "'All you others, follow me. My poor mother has led the way.' And he was obeyed, not over-willingly, for every man of them had seen the shade of his late mistress. "'Here,' said Tom to the doctor, "'on this spot I found the rosary. And see?' Just here in the bushes, it looks as if some person had pushed their way with difficulty. If the murdering wretch murdered her first, and then threw her into that strong current, where shall we find even her poor remains? They were standing near the point of land which I have already described, where the flooded creek took a strong bend and beat its swollen waters under a huge and half-uprooted tree. Gazing wistfully at the noisy and swirling water that caught the branches of the trees like wisps of weed and tossed them hither and thither helplessly, Tom saw the tree give a heavy lurch that surrendered its torn tresses farther on the rushing surface of the flood, and then it lost the grasp of years on the wet bank and fell with a crash and splash into the creek. Noiselessly after it, the red clay of the undermined bank slipped softly and with it came half-hidden, a still form in brown wincey, and with grey hair, stained with rain and soil, clinging on a sad white face. That face and form was seen thus but a moment. The next it was swirled in by the greedy waters, entangled by the long tresses of the ankylous tree, and swept down the stream in a tangle of leaves and water. There was but one exclamation of horror as the men, led by Farrell, rushed down to a narrow angle to intercept and rescue the body of the murdered woman. The man Clark was riding leisurely home from Praisby, and his face was shadowed as it had rarely been as he neared Cahirkenvelt. Had the man, after all, some remains of a conscience, and had it awakened during that sleepless night he had passed in fancying the deed to be done during its desecrated hours? 
However that may have been, when he met a body of men carrying a sad and dripping corpse with grey hair on a litter of branches, the head of which was borne by an almost broken-hearted son of the dead, he felt as though he would have given years of his own life to recall the one last night of it. He gave evidence against Turnbull at his trial, and so implicated himself, though not sufficiently to lay himself open to punishment heavy enough for his deserts. The plot had been skilfully laid by Turnbull for obtaining, as he expected, the entire control of a fine property untrammelled by the burden of a poor, silly old woman. His fall and loss of vigour had been all a pretence to avert suspicion, and Mrs. Turnbull's death had been accomplished by means of the phial of chloroform procured for him by Clark. When the poor woman had uttered her last prayer on her rosary that night, she had laid her head on a spot of cover lid saturated with chloroform, and it was a villain's strong arms that carried her helpless body to the deep chasm behind the old tree root near the creek, and its fall had disinterred her. To this day they speak at Praisby of Turnbull's cowardly expiation of his crime, and of the apparition and lost rosary that guided Tom Farrell to his mother's grave. The rosary had, in all probability, caught in the branches as Turnbull dragged his awful burden through them, but who can account for the appearance of the dead woman's spirit in the home she had loved and lost? End of story. End of stories from the detective's album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune.